going live. Hi, everybody. We are live. Boy, the YouTube new channel configuration here. You click a button and you're live. It doesn't warn you. If you click that button, it just assumes you know what you're doing, which is a pretty big assumption in this case. Hello, everybody. We are doing our Security Plus study group today. Thanks for joining us. Hello, chat room. I need to pop out the chat now so I can actually chat to people. There we go. Let's move this screen around so I can still keep an eye on the health of the stream. Stream health. Excellent. Uh, let's see. We got recordings going down here. We got recordings going up there. We got recordings going on YouTube. We've got uh, everything in front of us we need. This will be presentations. I think we're in good shape. Hi, everybody. <clears throat> Thanks for joining us. Hello, chat room. Biloxi, Mississippi is here. Is it cold in Mississippi, too, today? Got a little cold here in Florida. Hello, Nigeria. It is currently 45 degrees Fahrenheit here in Florida. It got down to freezing this morning. That happens from time to time in this neck of the woods. That's how that works. Hello, Houston. Hello, ATL. Atlanta, Georgia. Bahamas is here. There's Maryland. Welcome. Pasadena, Maryland. St. Vincent. Welcome. We've got all Security Plus today. Security Plus, Security Plus, and some more Security Plus. So we've got plenty to go through. All new questions. They're all new every month, every time. Hello, Garland, Texas, and Baltimore, and Cali, and Kansas, and South Africa, and Virginia, and Midland, and Riverside, and Canada. Got to tell Mrs. Professor Messer Canada checked in. It's always important. We have uh, we got kin folk up there, as we say here in the South. She does anyway. I accept them as well. Married into the family, I guess. That's the way it works. There's Riverside, California, Michigan, San Diego, Illinois. Madrid, the Philippines, D.C. Nobody ever checks in from A.C. No, oh, we had somebody from A.C. Uh, I think last week or last month. We have A.C. and D.C. Uh, we've got Cleveland, Sierra Vista, welcome. Houston, means I'm one day closer. There's Bellevue, Brooklyn. Maryland's here, San Diego, Clearwater. See, there's some locals. Hey, locals. Memphis is here. Very nice. Utah's checking in. Colorado, lots of folks. KC, I'm assuming that stands for Kansas City, considering your Chiefs reference. Los Angeles, welcome. Atlanta again. Hey, you took the SISA. Congratulations. Ian in the chat room, pass the SISA. SISA Plus, that is the next step up from Security Plus. So that's a, that's a good one to put on the resume. I'm sure employers will be happy to see that. That one's a little more hands-on, too. That one's a little more. You get to use some of the, the tools that we talk about in Security Plus. Colorado, London, Birmingham. Not sure which one. Maryland. My Maryland. There's Lebanon, Amsterdam, New Mexico. We're all over the place today. We've got all new questions for Security Plus. We've got... For the first hour. In the second hour, you're going to ask the questions. So we'll be in good shape there. So that's good. There's Niagara Falls. It's just up there this past year, enjoying that area, hanging out, going to the keg, having some ribs. There's Bahamas, India, and Puerto Rico. Hello, Michigan. Welcome. Jackson, Mississippi. We've got... Um, this one, I did these questions like two weeks ago. I did them way ahead of time. Normally, I do these questions maybe the weekend before. I did these so far ahead of time, I've forgotten what the questions are. So it will be all new for all of us. Maybe, maybe that's the way it's supposed to be. Hello, Morocco and Liverpool, England, and Dayton, Ohio, and Istanbul. The Stennis Space Center. Baltimore again. Very nice. We've got... I think probably the most number of people come to the Security Plus study group. I haven't really looked at the numbers on that. I really should. I know people are saying, why is the camera back here? Because we haven't started yet. This is the pre-show. We, we start in five minutes. After the pre-show, you'll see this. So don't worry. It's not all, hey, you get to see the back of my head the whole time. So don't worry. We, this is me trying to 
get everything ready to go on my side, making sure all my cameras are right and getting things ready to go. Don't worry. We'll, we'll get all of those happening. People, I, I get, I do get emails occasionally. I was going to watch your study group, but the first 10 minutes were just you talking. This is the pre-show. You can jump ahead and you'll be able to watch the actual show. But this is me trying to trying to warm things up, trying to get, uh, making sure everything's working, making sure the stream is on, et cetera, et cetera. I do need to do a video about uh, what the heck is going on around here, this whole setup, because it would be nice to document. Um, I do have plans to do that. Uh, you can see an overview of it at a, it's kind of a blind link right now. I haven't made it public on my website. It's professormesser.com slash studio. And you'll see all of the equipment, or most of mostly all of the equipment we use in the studio. Professormesser.com slash studio. And you'll be able to see that. Lowell, New York and West Virginia. Yorktown is here. Philly. Columbus. Not sure which one. Are you the only European? No, lots of Europeans on. They've already been checking in. Cleveland, welcome. Dallas, welcome. We've got, um, there's Largo. Went down to Tampa this past weekend. It was very nice. Drove all over. Stopped at the sponge docks. Got some Greek food on my way home. There's Louisville. Louisville. Very nice. Texas. No, Texas. Uh, San Luis Obispo. Obispo. I say it wrong every time. We only do this every month. Cleveland. Vegas. Lakewood Ranch, Florida. I'm going to have to do some checking there. I'm not exactly sure where that is. Virginia Beach, welcome. Dublin, Ohio, maybe not. Maybe somewhere different. Virginia Beach, Maryland, Indianapolis. Manila is here. Seattle checking in. Melbourne, see there's some more Florida folks checking in. We're going to get started about three minutes. Three minutes. So if you are watching this in the replay and you're sick and tired of me look, sitting here doing nothing effectively, I think I have everything ready. It doesn't always work that way. Sometimes you see me scrambling in these last numbers of minutes. Today, we're in pretty good shape. Knock on mouse pad to make that happen. Virginia Beach, Chattanooga. Welcome. There's Vero. Very nice. Let's see. Oh, Sarasota, Bradenton. So, okay. Kind of south of, uh, south of Tampa. Lakewood Ranch. Now it's locked in. Thank you. Afghanistan is here. Welcome. Baston. There's Orlando, Austin, Texas, keeping it weird. Louisville, again, or is it the same? London, England, Knoxville, Tennessee, Dallas, Texas, another Dayton. See, there's, there's some Europeans checking in. I try to do it at a time of day where I can kind of stretch over to the West Coast, stretch over to Europe, and try to get that happening. The Socrative room name is Professor Messer, all one word, P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R-M-E-S-S-E-R. There's somebody from my neck of the woods, the old days, uh, Pembroke Pines. I used to live in Pembroke Pines and Miramar out in Silver Lakes. I actually lived in two homes in Silver Lakes, one that was in Pembroke Pines, then moved south that was in Miramar. That's how big that area was. We'll answer questions in just a moment. Pop open a new browser window. Go to professormesser.com slash QA. We'll talk all about that in just a moment, about a minute and a half. We'll talk all about those. So is it cheating on the QA if you watched last month's replay yesterday? There's no cheating here. It's all good. In fact, you'll notice if you were watching last month's, no, you didn't see this question on last month's. This is the study group rewind that you didn't see unless you were here live because I got it wrong. I typed it incorrectly. So the study group rewind is only a rewind if you were here live. Now, if you're watching last month's replay, you're going to get all new questions. You get all new questions every month. So there's no cheating there either. So that's kind of how that works. There's Hollywood. Welcome. Used to work on Hollywood Boulevard in South Florida, in Broward County, in downtown Hollywood, right there at the Circle. And uh, got to tell you, one of the weirdest places I've ever worked. So that's, you will see the screen in front of me. Yes, it's, you don't have to squint. You will, you will see the actual screen that comes up, I promise. We don't worry. This is not the this is not the actual study group. The actual study group starts in just a few seconds. So let me get things ready on my side. Let's get this gone. Let's bring up the presentation. That's not the presentation. That's the presentation. 
Green light is good. Presentation is going there. I think we're ready to get started everywhere. Uh, we are ready to get started right now. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the January 2020 Professor Messer Security Plus Study Group coming to you live from Messer Studios here in our headquarters. Thanks for joining us. My name is James Messer. I will be your host for this next hour of q and I'm going to ask you questions that come directly from the CompTIA Security Plus exam objectives, and then you will answer them live and online if you are here watching this live. If you're watching it on a replay, you won't be able to answer them live, but you can follow along with the rest of us to see exactly what's going on. We're glad that you're here. We've got a lot of things to go through, so let's first get the the rewind question out of the way, and then I have just a couple of announcements we'll go through. If you are joining us live, you can answer the questions today in this first hour by going to professormesser.com slash QA. So pop open a new browser window, and you can go professormesser.com slash QA. You've also got a room that you can go to if you have the Socrative student app. It will ask you for a room name. The room name is Professor Messer, all one word. Make sure you spell it right. P-R-O-F-E-S-S-O-R-M-E-S-S-E-R. -E -E and if you do spell it right, there will be a question waiting for you right now. That question asks, which of the following would commonly require authentication to gain access to a network? Would it be anti-spoofing? Would it be 802.1x? Would it be STP? Would it be SIM? Or would it be DLP? So those are your five options. We'll come back to those in just a moment for requiring authentication to gain access to a network, anti-spoofing, 802.1x, STP, SIM, or DLP. Well, in this first hour, you're going to be answering questions. In our second hour, I turn the whole thing around and have you call in and ask questions from the chat room. So if you have questions, be sure to keep those there and uh, write them down. Make sure you have them for the second hour. Today, we're going to talk all about the SY0501 here in this first hour. It's a version of the exam for Security Plus that was released on October the 4th of 2017. Now, we know that CompTIA tends to update these about every three years. Plus, there's a little bit of an overlap between the new one and the old one. So if you are studying for the SY0501, I would estimate this version of the exam will still be available into about the April timeframe of 2021. So if you're watching this live in January 2020, you've got more than a year before this exam goes anywhere. So you don't have to worry about that. You're absolutely studying the right certification. This exam is 90 minutes long. It's a single exam. You may get a maximum of 90 questions, maybe fewer than 90 questions. The passing score from a scale of 100 to 900 is a 750. Kind of an odd scale kind of an odd passing score, and they don't tell you how they grade it. So all I can really tell you is do the best you can, and the numbers will work out at the end regardless of what happens. There's a mix of different questions on the exam. There may be multiple choice questions, very similar to the one we just looked at. And the other one is performance-based questions. The performance-based questions are questions that are not multiple choice. We'll talk more about those in just a moment. Of course, you have a Security Plus question of the week available on Twitter. If you go to professormesser.com slash Twitter, you can follow me there. We also have all our Security Plus videos on YouTube every minute of every video. I don't hold anything back. There's no paywall. There's no registration. Just go out and watch them. They're just there. I had somebody send me a note the other day in the chat room. Do I just click on these? Yes, that's all you have to do. You just have to click on them. There's nothing else you would have to do. I know, kind of weird, but there you go. You also have your weekly Security Plus question also now on Instagram. You'll find that at professormesser.com slash Instagram. If you're an Instagrammer, that's another neat way to get your A Plus Network Plus and Security Plus questions every week. Don't forget about my course notes. I take all of the important information from my videos, those many, many, many hours of videos, and I shrink them down into one single set of course notes. So all the text, all the graphics, all the important charts, they are in these course notes. I think I have the course notes up on the screen. Do I have them? I do. So here's the course notes. They're a PDF file. They're big for Security Plus, over 93, 94 pages. But if you go to a certain section of the course notes, it's all here. So the things that you may be writing down and spending all this time and maybe missing if you're not able to catch all the videos, I've already got these course notes. So you can find out more about those at professormesser.com slash security CN. 
Also, another way you can help support us is by visiting Amazon and purchasing things by going to professormesser.com slash Amazon. This will give you a link to go over to Amazon. You pay exactly the same price, the same low price that you've always paid at Amazon, but they give us a small commission every time you buy something. It's a great way to support the site without having to spend any extra money at all. That's at professormesser.com slash Amazon. This podcast is available on a video replay on my website at professormesser.com, but there's also a podcast version of this, an audio form, available at professormesser.com slash podcast. So the moment I put it online, it automatically gets downloaded to your podcast application. I'll also say that if you wait about a day or so, uh, I have Lori, my marketing manager, goes back through this entire live presentation and she puts timestamps on all of this. So if you go to the YouTube video description, there will now be timestamps, of course, on all the previous study groups. And this one will probably be done tomorrow. So you can always go back and find out exactly where to go to find all of the information you are looking for. Let's go back to this question. If you want to answer the question, remember, you go to professormesser.com slash QA to answer the question that asks, which of the following would commonly require authentication to gain access to a network? Which of the following would commonly require authentication to gain access to a network? Anti-spoofing, 802.1x, STP, SIM, or DLP. And you can see 91% of you say it's 802.1x. Well, for those of you familiar with that term, that is network access control. That's a way to allow or disallow access to the network until somebody authenticates into the network. The network access control, a very common way to do this. It is It can be difficult to implement, but you very commonly see this on things like wireless networks. It can be used anywhere, of course. But if you're ever on a corporate wireless network and you notice that you have to authenticate to connect to that wireless network, it may be using 802.1x in order to do that. So the correct answer here, 802.1x, that was the right answer. 92% of you knew that was the right answer. You knew it couldn't be anti-spoofing. That's to keep somebody from uh, pretending that they are someone else, usually by changing an IP address or a MAC address. It would not be STP. I guess the spanning tree protocol would probably the one be the one that comes to mind there and not the shielded twisted pair. The spanning tree protocol prevents loops in a layer two network and a switched network so that layer two switching uh, that you are doing can be uh, protected and make sure that that remains non-looping by using STP. A SIM is your enterprise management system, a security system that is able to capture log files from all of these different systems, consolidate them down to a single space where you can look through those log files. Or you can, of course, go through, hold on a moment, let me change some things over here. You can go through that, look at those log files, and consolidate them and create reports from them as well. Whenever I get a uh, people that say, I need to get into security, I need to do more with security, you're going to be working a lot with a security information event manager, but we just call it a SIM. So if somebody says, do you know anything about a SIM? That's what they're talking about. And the last one on this list was a DLP, data loss prevention. If you're looking to see if somebody is able to go out and, uh, and send information across the network like credit cards, social security numbers, or anything else that may be private. You can block those or at least control them or be notified from that this is happening by using a DLP, a data loss prevention solution. They have solutions that are, will run on people's operating systems. They run on the network. There's many different ways to implement DLP. But in this case, 92% of you are absolutely on the mark. That is absolutely what this is. It is the 802.1x so that you can gain access to the network. For those of you asking about the podcasting piece of it in the chat room, you can find the podcasts everywhere. Uh, if you have a podcasting place that you go to now, you go to Spotify, you go to Apple's iTunes, you go to the Android, uh, I guess it's the Google podcasting app. There, It's everywhere. You will find it wherever it happens to be. So that's where we go with the podcasting piece of it. Let's now move forward with the first new question of the month. And as many of you know, on these study groups, I like to do a performance-based question as the first question of the month. The performance-based questions, just to remind you, are a little different than multiple choice. 
performance-based questions could be fill in the blank. They might put you at a command prompt and ask you to perform a particular function. It may be a matching question. It may be a drag and drop question. It may be one where you have to sort things in a particular order. We never know exactly what the questions will be. But the first handful of questions you get on your exam will be performance-based questions. So I don't want you to be thrown by that. You'll suddenly get this very first relatively complex question. A lot of people worry that the entire exam will be this way. It will not be. In fact, I usually tell people they jump ahead past those, do the rest of the multiple choice, maybe then come back. It depends on how you work best. But I have for you, we aren't going to jump ahead in this one. We're going to give you a performance-based question first thing. And this one is a fill-in-the-blank. It's a little more difficult than the ones we've had before. On most of your Security Plus exams, you're going to run into questions that are ones that have a matching or at least give you an idea of what it is. I don't think there are any fill-in-the-blank performance-based questions on Security Plus. Here is your performance-based question of the month. This question asks, what secure protocol should be used for these tasks? So I have five tasks available. The first one is remotely access the command line of a device. What secure protocol would you use? The other is to verify the username and password of a VPN user. The third is to attend the weekly all-hands conference call. The fourth is to send an email with a digital signature. And the fifth is to purchase a train ticket online. Now, if you think you know the answer, do not answer in the chat room. Don't give any hints in the chat room. Don't even pretend that you're going to do that in the chat room. You instead need to answer the question by going to professormesser.com slash QA. So pop open a new browser window. Go to professormesser.com slash QA. And this is a fill-in-the-blank question. Yeah, I was thinking of making this one matching. That's what you would commonly see on the exam. There might be four or five of these uh, different tasks that they give you. And then I give you 10 different protocols. So it's a, not always a one-to-one -one match. They try to throw you a curveball sometimes. But I thought, let's see how well we do by really understanding these protocols. There's an entire section of the exam objectives, and I'll tell you more about that in a moment, that talks about these protocols. So it's important to know what they are. That kind of makes sense if you're working on a security certification. It would be nice if you knew which protocols were secure. Just saying. It's one that does come in handy, too, if you're ever trying to work on an application, audit the way an application is communicating, being able to really keep everything across the network as safe as possible. You need to know about these protocols. Um, it's, it's one of these situations where a third party might come in and install a new piece of software, install a new piece of hardware, and you may be wondering, how is that communicating over the network? We need to make sure it's using secure protocols. That's where we would go for these. So all five of these, by the way, come directly from the CompTIA exam objectives. If you are looking at one of these and thinking, I'm not sure what they're asking for, make sure you get the exam objectives. You can always get them at professormesser.com slash objectives. And uh, no Googling. You're not going to be able to Google this one anyway. Nobody's ever seen this question before. These are all brand new. So it's not going to be on the Google. So sorry. You're going to have to figure this one out on your You can figure it out. I know you can. I know you've got these down. There's uh, five different secure protocols. Remotely access the command line of a device. Verify the username and password of a VPN user. Attend the weekly all-hands conference call. Send an email with a digital signature and purchase a train ticket online. And there are no options here. You have to fill in the blank for those. Let's see how we did with this one. Are we ready? Let's step through to figure out the details of this. This, by the way, comes from uh, section 2.6 on the SY0501. And my video for this is titled Secure Protocols. And this is just a subset of the protocols you need to know. So that's that's where we're going to step through this. Let's start with number one, remotely access the command line of a device. This might be an easy one to start off with. This would be SSH, secure shell. So if you are trying to connect to the command line of a device across the network and you want to use a secure protocol, it's going to be SSH. And not like you would think, folks in the chat room, not Telnet. Do not use Telnet. You've watched my videos. You know we're not using any Telnet. Never, never, never use Telnet. Never, ever. 
use Telnet. Second on our list is to verify the username and password of a VPN user. So this is a very common process, of course. We're connecting in. We're staying at a hotel. We need to connect to our VPN. We connect to our VPN concentrator across the, the, uh, the public network, the unprotected network, and we need to authenticate with our username and password. Now, how does that username and password get verified by the AAA server? It's going to use a secure protocol to do that, such as LDAPS, Lightweight Directory Access Protocol Secure. LDAP would be commonly used to do this lookup, to look up a username and a password. LDAPS is the one that you would use to be able to do this securely so that that communication is encrypted. The third on our list was to attend the weekly All Hands Conference Call. Now, for those of you that uh, get to listen in on the weekly All Hands Conference Call, which I did for, I don't know, 20 years of my professional career, you know it's a great call to be on. There's nothing you look forward to more during the week than getting on the weekly All Hands Conference Call. When they have to cancel it, your entire day is so shot. You don't want to be in that situation. But now we have to do this securely. We want to be sure that the communication that we're using these days is voice over IP. So what voice over IP protocol would be protected, would be secure to be able to do this? It would be RTP for the real-time transport protocol, but we want it secure. We put an S at the beginning to specify this is SRTP, the secure real-time transport protocol. It's a pretty secure protocol, and if you're doing voice over IP, you're probably going to want to be doing this by default to be able to do that. Uh, the fourth on our list, sending an email with a digital signature. Well, to be able to do that, we would use MIME, but of course, we need it to be secure, so we do a secure version of MIME called SMIME Secure multi-purpose internet mail extensions is one of the ways that you can send email with a digital signature. Now, if you said uh, I would use PGP, I guess you could do that as well. PGP is certainly a secure way to do a digital signature in an email. I'll accept either one of those. We're pretty flexible here. This is nothing is written in stone on the Security Plus study group. Uh, last on our list, purchase a train ticket online. I gave you an easy one at the beginning. I'm hopefully giving you an easy one here at the end. And that's why this one would be HTTPS. Hopefully, you're very familiar with that, the Hypertext Transfer Protocol secure version on usually port 443 to be able to use HTTP, to be able to use all of those. So there's where we would focus on using these different protocols, accessing the command line of a device is SSH, verifying the username and password of a VPN user, LDAPS. Very easy way to do that. Uh, the weekly all hands conference call using voice over IP would use SRTP, the secure version of RTP. We've got SMIME for our digital signature with email and purchasing a train ticket online would be HTTPS. And now some of you have said, well, I could use RADIUS to do my username and password of a VPN user if you are doing the secure version of RADIUS. I guess that would apply there as well. RADIUS is the same protocol name, whether we have it over a secure channel or not. Uh, another common way to use that. LDAPS is another good way. Uh, we could use Kerberos. I would accept Kerberos on here because Kerberos by default. Diameter, I would accept that if anybody used it. Just can't find anybody. I found one person using diameter. Uh, maybe there's maybe there's a few more people that have decided to install that and use it these days. The problem is finding devices and software that will use diameter. That's your problem. If you're probably in a uh, environment where you are a service provider, you're probably using diameter. If you're anyone else out here in the real world, you service provider people. You you know what I'm saying. You have your own thing going on there. None of us are using diameter. That's a that's a you thing, just so you know that. Uh, but if you're running radius, it's basically the same thing with some extra things thrown in there. I guess TACX Plus would apply there as well. People often say, which one do you use? Do you use TACX Plus? Do you use radius? Do you use LDAP? Do you use Kerberos? What do you use? You use whatever fits. Whatever. Sometimes you're using a piece of equipment. All it does is radius. Okay, I'm going to use radius. Sometimes you're using a piece of equipment that needs to integrate with uh, Microsoft Active Directory. Well, Active Directory does both Kerberos 
and it does LDAP. So those are the two you would use. So you've got some options there that, that are available, but hopefully some of these should get you thinking about which protocols to use to make some of these things happen. Hopefully you did well on these. We won't be able to look at your list because it's a fill in the blank, but if I scroll through the list now, a lot of you did pretty well on this one. Everybody got SSH. Everybody got HTTPS. Everything in the middle, kind of iffy. So there's a, there's a couple there to worry about. Uh, by the way, those of you wondering, diameter is not in the CompTIA exam objectives because nobody uses it. Sorry, that's just the way it is. Those, there's some people that are using diameter that will send me very angry emails, and I look forward to your messages. Let's do another question. Here we go. The next question asks, which of the following would be the best use of SHA-2? Which of the following would be the best use of SHA-2? Would it be to confidentially transfer email messages over public networks? Would it be to securely store passwords in a centralized database? Would it be to transfer private keys over a public network? Would it be to hide data inside of graphics file? Or would it be to use the same key when encrypting and decrypting? Well, there are your five different options, all five of them legitimate. Make sure that if you're planning to answer this question, you don't answer in the chat room. You go to professormesser.com slash QA. Please lock in your answer there online. And please, no hints in there to tell us. For those of you listening on the podcast, let me give this to you again. The question asks, which of the following would be the best use of SHA-2? The question, uh, and the possible answers are, confidentially transfer email messages over public networks, securely store passwords in a centralized database, transfer private keys over a public network, hide data inside of graphics files, or use the same key when encrypting and decrypting. One of those would be the best use of SHA-2. If you think you know the answer, lock it in at professormesser.com slash QA. I think you may know this one. I'm not even going to look at what you've answered, though. I like it to be a surprise. Sometimes I peek, just so you know. Sometimes I take a look, see how it's going. It's much more fun if we all look at the same time, though. So I'm going to see how we do on this one. A lot of you are locking in your answers very quickly. I do get to see the numbers as they're counting up. I'm looking at this on my screen, and I watch the numbers count up, 172, 173. So I watch to see how fast do we get to 100. And if we get to 100 really fast, I think, OK, people really know the answer to this. Uh, sometimes I'm surprised, though when we get to that point. Let's see how we did with this one. Which of the following would be the best use of SHA-2? I guess you'd need to know what SHA-2 is before answering the question. And maybe we don't know. Because the results show us that 43% of us, uh, not a majority, but the plurality, says that this is a way to secure store, securely store passwords in a centralized database. 26%, just 25%, uh, a quarter of us say, this is how you would transfer private keys over a public network. 18% say we, this is how you use the same key when encrypting and decrypting. That's what we would do with SHA-2. 10%, double digits just popped up there, confidentially transfer email messages over public networks. That's what SHA-2 would be. Only 2% say to hide data inside of a graphics file. Well, that's kind of sad. Maybe, maybe it is that one. I don't think it is. 2%, there's no way we would do that. First, let's back up a little bit and talk about SHA. SHA in the news recently, talk about this. SHA is the secure hash algorithm developed by the United States National Security Agency as part of their FIPS, the Federal Information Processing Standard. If you are at all familiar with the U.S. federal government, then you are certainly familiar with FIPS and all of those standards. SHA-1 uh, was one that was widely used, 160 bits in that hash digest. Uh, in 2005, there were some collision attacks that were published. And most recently, this last week, they published updates. There have been many, many collision attacks found since that date. This past week, they, they took a modern technology and said if you used modern equipment, how fast could you really create a collision attack for sha and I think it was just a matter of hours, right? It was less than that. Uh, they were able to do it very, very, very easily with $45,000 worth of a computer equipment. That's pretty easy to do these days. So that's one where that would occur. SHA-2, kind of what people are using these days, that is preferred. Up to 512-bit digest. There's different sizes that you can have. There's a SHA-256. There's a SHA-512. So there's different SHA versions for SHA-2. 
Uh, but SHA-1 is so easy to calculate. It calculates without a lot of overhead these days. There are places where SHA-1 might still be used. Uh, this is a case where SHA-2 is pr pretty much what everybody's using, though. And if you're going to use SHA, if you're going to create an application for that, that's why you would do this. Well, why are you using this hash to begin with? Why is this useful to anyone? This hash is a short string of text that effectively represents a larger amount of data. We sometimes refer to this as a message digest. It's not an encrypted version of the data. It's not a duplication of the data. It's simply a hash that we create to, to represent what that data is. And it's a one-way hash. It's a one-way trip. Once we create the hash, you can't somehow back up out of the hash to figure out what the original content was. And because of that, it is so perfect for storing passwords. Makes sense. We can put in our password, we'll hash it, we'll store it somewhere. If somebody comes across the hash, they'll think, I'll use this hash and I'll figure out what the password is by reversing the process. Oh, wait, hashing can't be reversed. There's no way to reverse out the password from the hash that was saved. So it's perfect to be able to do that. Some people will also use hashes to verify information. If you're doing any type of forensics, you can grab a hash of some information. Later on, you can go back and have a look at that hash to see if it really was the same data you were looking at as the original. Uh, this also can be used in digital signatures where you have the hash. Then we encrypt the hash. There's things, lots of things you can do with hashes. So this is a case where we use hashes all the time to be able to work through this. So if you are someone who is trying to figure out where would I use a hash, the 45% of you said securely store passwords in a centralized database, a perfect place to use a hash, most likely a salted hash. And of course, salting is part of the CompTIA exam objectives where we have a hash, we add some extra data to it to make it very difficult for somebody to perform a brute force attack on those hashes. Uh, the folks that answered transfer private keys over a public network, you were probably thinking about a key exchange protocol such as Diffie-Hellman. That would be what we would use. We would not use SHA-2 for that particular function. Using the same key when encrypting and decrypting, 18% chose that one. That is symmetric encryption. That has nothing to do with SHA-2. SHA-2 does not encrypt. SHA-2 is a hashing algorithm. Uh, the confidentially transferring email messages over public networks. Well, we might use PGP for that. We might use Secure Mime for that. We would not use SHA-2 because SHA-2 does not do anything confidentially. SHA-2 is not an encryption mechanism. SHA-2 is a hashing mechanism. And then we have hiding data inside of a graphics file. That type of obfuscation is steganography. Steganography is what we would use. And hiding data, often you would encrypt the data before storing it. And again, SHA-2 doesn't encrypt anything. Uh, SHA-2 is a hashing algorithm. So those are the things that you would run into. And of course, there's many, many, many other things you can do with SHA-2. But the only one that applies in this list is to securely store passwords in a centralized database. If you answered answer B, 46, 47% of you got that one. Absolutely right. Well done. Let's do another Security Plus question. Oh, by the way, this one, for those of you wondering, come from Section 6.1 of the exam objectives and my video named Hashing and Digital Signatures. That's where you can find more about hashing and being able to use that. Let's do another question. I've got one for you right here. The question asks, a Soho router company has recently announced a security issue for one of their routers. Which of the following would best describe this vulnerability? Would it be an end-of-life vulnerability? Would it be lack of vendor support? Would it be a race condition? Would it be improper input handling? Or would it be an embedded system vulnerability? Five different options there, all five of them, vulnerabilities you should be aware of, all five of them in the exam objectives. Let's have you lock in your answer. A Soho router company has recently announced a security issue for one of their routers, which of the following would best describe this vulnerability? Would it be an end-of-life vulnerability? Would it be a lack of vendor support? Would it be a race condition? Would it be improper input handling? Or would it be embedded system vulnerability? If you think you know the answer, you would like to answer this online if you're watching this live, 
open up a new browser window and go to professormesser.com slash QA and you can lock in your answer. Be able to put that in there. And again, no answering in the chat room. Thank you so much. Being able to have that there. So this is very useful to have that and have those things there. I think if you ever work through these and you're trying to figure out what do we do, how do we go with this, what direction is going to make sense for all of these, this is where you would go to have that there. Hopefully this is, you're familiar with this if you step through these and you're familiar with, uh, with these vulnerabilities. This one's going to be easy for you. Hopefully you are being able to work through all that. This is one also, as I'm writing these, I'm thinking, how could we get across the idea of these vulnerabilities? And I want to use all five things in the answer that are real. So hopefully you're familiar with some of with all five of them. If you're not, make a note of whichever one sounds funny to you that you're not familiar with, that you're trying to figure out, because all five of them, again, are from the exam objectives. Make sure you're familiar with that. So lock in your answer. Go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer there. I think a number of you are trying to figure this one out. We got another good group of you that are awe, that have answered very, very quickly. So I hopefully we're in the same situation where we know what it is, we've locked it in, and we happen to know what those are. Let's see how we do with this one. Let's, uh, let's check your answers. Uh, Soho Router Companies recently announced a security issue for one of their routers. Which of the following would best describe this vulnerability? How did we do? 73% of you say that it is E, an embedded system vulnerability. Double digits, 10% of you said lack of vendor support. And it all falls off from there. 8% said it's an end-of-life vulnerability. 5% said it is a race condition. And 4% say it is improper input handling. Well, in this particular case, the Soho Router Company said, we've got a vulnerability. Now, they haven't said anything about if they're going to fix it or not. So that's, that's the situation you sometimes will run into with these, is you never are quite sure uh, what happens next. But we know, based on what they have said in this question, we know what these could possibly be. So we know, looking at this, that it's a Soho router. It's something that is embedded and having these things in here. So the best possible answer is that this is an embedded system. This is the one where you would absolutely see what the answer is because you don't have direct access to this Soho device. You don't have a way to load Windows on it. You don't have to wait to run Linux on it. There are some Soho routers that do support, or at least third-party software that supports being loaded on some of these, but it's not common on these devices. You really would consider these embedded systems where you don't have direct access to the operating system. These, of course, are connected to the internet. So if there is a bad vulnerability, and this has already happened, where millions of Soho routers have been made accessible to the bad guys because the embedded firmware had known vulnerabilities. So this is one whenever I start walking through all of this and trying to figure out where do I go with these directions, this is sort of right out of the, ripped out of the pages as they say, of the newspaper where uh, in June 2017, Linksys and D-Link routers uh, were very easy to get the administrative password. Uh, this is one that we found out the CIA knew about this when there were uh, WikiLeaks of something called Vault 7 that, that made everyone aware that they knew this. And what they did was they gained access to your router then they installed their own version of firmware that then had a backdoor that allowed them in uh, from that point on effectively. So you always have to be worried about all of those. And this is one where we do have to worry about those types of vulnerabilities. If a, a Soho router company says we have a vulnerability, you need to make sure you're updating that firmware. And that would be an embedded system vulnerability. The Soho router company didn't say we're not going to fix it because that device has been is too old and we're not going to do anything with it. If they did, that would be an end-of-life vulnerability where they said we're not going to support this anymore. We are the Windows 7, if you will, of this Soho router. No more support for you, that kind of thing. 10% uh, is a lack of vendor support. The vendor in this case didn't say anything. There was nothing in there that said we will not be supporting you any longer so it would not lead us to the fact that there would be a lack of vendor support. 
A race condition is a very specific type of vulnerability where th two things happen at the same time. Sometimes one happens first, sometimes the other one happens first, and there's no way to control that. Race condition is very difficult for developers when they're trying to resolve those types of problems. In this case, we don't even know what type of vulnerability it was. So that is why uh, this, this race condition did not apply here. And in proper input handling, there's no mention in this question about any type of input, so that would not be the correct answer either. The best description of this vulnerability would be an embedded system vulnerability answer. Ian, 74% of you were spot on with that one. No problems knowing exactly what that one happened to be. Well, if you like these types of questions, then you're really going to like my practice exams. The practice, I have an entire book that I wrote of three separate practice exams that are built and designed to emulate the same style, the same structure, the same voice, the same uh, type of writing that you might find in an actual CompT exam. These are not questions from the exam. This is not a copy of questions. These are questions that I wrote, but I wrote them in the same vein, in the same style, so that you could be prepared for this. The Security Plus exam is a very complex exam, and the questions are, they're very wordy. There's like a paragraph of things on some of these questions. Other questions, very short. So one of the things you can do is to get as much Q&A as possible. I always mention you should get Watch videos, get a book, good book, get plenty of hands-on, and get plenty of Q&A. And that's why I wrote this practice exams book. The practice exams are built so that you can go through three 90-question exams that include everything from performance-based questions to multiple-choice-based questions. And let's, let's give you just a page of one of these right now. So here's one where Rodney, a security engineer, is viewing this record from the firewall logs. Which of the following can be observed from this log information? And you can choose A, B, C, or D. And I give a quick answer. We can simply jump to which is it, A, B, C, or D. Just give me the raw answer. And then I also give you an option to go to the details of the answer. And it's over on this side of the page. Here we go. And I tell you what the answer is. And I give you an, a, a good explanation of what that answer is. And then, unlike other tests that you may have seen, I go through all of the incorrect answers, and I explain why every single one of the incorrect answers was wrong. I, this is not something you would commonly see anywhere else, but this is what I always wanted when I was doing exams. And at the bottom of every answer, I give you a link that you can click on if you have the digital version that goes directly to the video where this particular topic is described. And I also have a QR code. So if you have your camera, you can point your, in fact, you can do this right now if you're watching this video. You can just open the camera that's on your phone. You don't even have to take a picture. Just point it at the QR code, and it will ask you if you would like to open the page that has this particular video on it, which makes it very easy to find what you're looking for. So there's a feedback loop there. After every question, you can go back and forth on this and get an understanding of what was the question, what was the answer, and why was it right and why was it wrong. So I think that's a pretty strong way to help study for your exams. Three separate exams are available. You can find out more about purchasing this along with my course notes, my videos, my audio, and everything else, including my uh, study hacks book. That's a new one that's out that comes with my bundled uh, success bundle. Uh, you can find out more about all of those at professormesser.com slash security PE, security practice exam, security PE. We'll find that. And of course, the links that are on my website, another way to help support the site. Thank you so much for your ongoing support. And for the folks that have already purchased it, I'm getting great feedback from you. Thank you so much for that as well. Let's do some more questions. We've got security plus questions galore here. So let's do some more. The next question asks, speaking of protocols. A security engineer would like to verify that an application is communicating using encrypted protocols. So kind of fits with that very first question we had. This question, though, asks, which of the following would provide this verification? A security engineer would like to verify that an application is communicating using encrypted protocols. Which of the following would provide this verification? Would it be TCP dump? Would it be NMAP? Would it be NetStat? Would it be dig or would it be trace route? So we need to verify that an application is communicating using encrypted protocols. Would we use TCP dump, nmap, netstat, dig, or trace route? Lock in your answers 
by going to professormesser.com slash QA, and you'll be able to lock those in. Yeah, the Study Hacks book is a, is a new book that I wrote. It's a short ebook that has, it's more of a, a book that describes my strategies for taking the exam. So it's not really Security Plus book as much as it is how should you prepare for the exam? What do you do during the exam? And what can you do after the exam? So there's a lot of things that you can do that have nothing to do with studying your exam objectives. And I tried to put every single tip that I've ever thought of, I put into my study hacks book. It's more of a life hack than it is an exam hack for this. So hopefully that was, uh, that was a good one. So this is one where hopefully you're familiar with some of these ideas. We talked about having a way that you can make sure you're using the secure protocols, but now how you verify it. That's what you really want to know is how do you verify that you are using these. Uh, this is where you have to step through these different tools. And all five of these tools, by the way, again, come directly from the exam objectives. So make sure you know all of these tools. You may be asked about what each one of these does. We're going to talk about what each one of these does in just a moment. Because if you are a security professional, you will be using all of these and more, and, and many more, <laughs> for sure. No question. Uh, in my role as a systems engineer for a next-gen firewall company, I used many, many tools, including all of these. Not all the time, but there was always times when it became pretty important to be able to do that. Let's see how you did with we still have not 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 a lot of people locking this one in yet so this is going to be an interesting one to see how we do we've just gotten to 200 answers on this let's see how you did with locking this one in let's click the how do we do button and just as i expected just as i thought i didn't expect it i was hoping but uh, i was hoping that we would have a, a clear winner but we don't we're kind of all over the place 36 percent 37 percent we go with the one that's on, on the top of the list is TCP dump. We have 27% right behind it that said Netstat is the way to do this. 21% said Nmap. So really, the bulk of the answers are those top three. Could it be any one of them? We're going to find out in a moment. 8% said Traceroute. 7% said Dig. Effectively, a two-way tie in fourth place for all of those. Let's see what I think it should be. If you are trying to verify that an application is communicating using an encrypted protocol, the best way and perhaps the only way to be able to do this is to look at the actual traffic going over the network. It is the only way that you would ever be able to confirm this. And the best way to do this right from the command line, use TCP dump. TCP dump will take all of the data going over the network and it will capture this information. If you're running in a different operating system like Windows, you can use WinDump. Mac OS has TCP dump already in there to be able to do that. And then you can save that and open it up in a different protocol analysis tool, such as Wireshark, if you'd like to be able to look at a lot more detail of that information. Uh, because this is at the command line, you'll see a command line breakdown for TCP dump that looks a little bit like this. You can see data moving in one direction or the other. This is a just some IPv6 that I captured. There's a little bit of IPv4 thrown in there for DNS. And you can see it going back and forth to my machine that I'm doing in front of me. But this is a way that you can really see the data going over the network. Now, this is just showing us header information. But there are options within TCP dump to look at the data itself. So you can really get into the data and break this down and really understand more about what it is doing across the network. Uh, it's a fantastic tool to use. You should absolutely become familiar with it. You don't want to be using or trying to figure out how to use TCP dump right when you need to do it. So that does become a little bit more of a challenge to make that happen. But this is one from a command line perspective that you really can't beat. This TCP dump is the way to see this. Now, if you're already in a graphical front end, if you have a third party uh, product at the side, if you're using Wireshark, you've got a tap, you can plug into the connection. Those are other ways to do it. But Wireshark not on this list. So you had to go with whatever one was available from the list of five that I provided to you. TCP dump 
definitely the one that I would choose. Hopefully that helps. Uh, let's go through these other answers. So 27% said Netstat. Netstat has enormous number of tools available to it, and it can tell you what port numbers and what services are running over those port numbers. It can give you information about the traffic flows and how much traffic is going back and forth on all of these, but it won't show you the actual data. And until you see the packets themselves and the hex breakdown of those packets and the ASCII breakdown of that, you really can't tell if this information is encrypted or not. You have to be able to see the raw data to be able to do that. Uh, for example, you could easily send non-encrypted HTTP traffic over port 443. Just change the configuration of your web server. So if you use Netstat, Netstat said, oh, it's using HTTP is running over 443. You think, oh, it's encrypted. It may not be. So you only are able to verify by looking at the packets themselves. InMap, a great tool to use to determine what ports might be open on another device and perhaps even what services or operating system may be running on another device. But it won't tell you if the data going back and forth is encrypted for that particular service. InMap does not provide that level of information. Traceroute will give you an idea of the routes between point A and point B. What are all the different routers between those two different devices? But it says tells you nothing about encryption, tells you nothing about the way applications are being used. And then DIG, the Domain Internet Groper, the DIG is what they call that. That's a way to query a domain name server. So if you need to find the name based on an IP address or the IP address based on the name of a device, DIG is great for using that. It's the kind of the newer flavor of, of, of being able to query name servers. So instead of NSLOOKUP, we'd use DIG to be able to do that. And there's also DIG executables available for Windows. In my video, I describe how you're able to do that. DIG doesn't tell you anything about the way applications are working, though. So the best option here, really the only option here, TCP dump. That is the one that we would use to be able to do that. DIG is not only in Linux. You can find DIG for practically any operating system these days. Uh, it is the one that effectively has replaced NSLOOKUP. So being able to do that is that is the important part uh, to be able to find all of those. Hopefully, you are familiar with these tools. Again, if any of these tools look new to you, they look unfamiliar, they look like something is not quite what I would recognize, make a note of that. There is, of course, this tool and many others you should know about. This comes directly from the SY0501 Section 2.2, the Command Line Security Tools video. Have a look at that video, and that might help you be able to look through all of these different tools and have them available. That's a great one to use, too. Let's see what our next question might be. I have another one for you. We've got time for a couple more. Let's break this one down. This question asks, a network architect needs to offload web server encryption. Let me click this so you can see it on your side. Hold on a moment as I talk. Here we go. A network architect needs to offload web server encryption to increase the speed of a public web application. Which of the following would best fit this requirement? Would it be a VPN concentrator? Would it be a forward proxy? Would it be a packet filter? Would it be an SSL accelerator? Would it be a DDoS mitigation? Five real tools. We have to know what all five of those do. A network architect needs to offload web server encryption to increase the speed of a public web application. Which of the following would best fit this requirement? Would it be VPN concentrator? Would it be forward proxy? Would it be packet filter? Would it be SSL accelerator? Or would it be DDoS mitigation? If you think you know the answer, go to professormesser.com slash QA. Lock in that answer. Please, no answers in the chat room. Great way to do this. I think that would be a great way to go through and be familiar with all of these. For those of you asking, TCP dump, uh, not commonly something you would find in Windows, but there is a Windows version, WinDump, if you're on Windows, to be able to do that at the command line. So I think that might help to be able to, to make all of those things happen. Whenever we start breaking down all of these tools, all of the products you would use, all the devices, when you're on an enterprise network, uh, being able to use all of these and know where they fit is very important. This is the same thing on the Network Plus exam. It's the same thing on the Security Plus exam. There's a huge number of tools you need to be familiar with. And all of them are things that you will find in an enterprise network. In fact, uh, probably I've been in plenty of data centers 
that had one of each of these and many other devices on their network and running. So hopefully that will help all of us as we go through trying to figure out what that answer is. I'm looking at the numbers again as you're as you're punching it in. It's going a little slower. We're having to think about this one a little more, I think, in being able to break some of these down. So let's see if we can do that and make some of this happen. Whenever I go through these questions, I try to make them be a little practical. Now, the questions that we do on these study groups are designed to see how well you remember the topics from the exam. They're not necessarily made to emulate what you would find on the exam uh, the same style. There's just not enough room on the screen in some cases to put some of the very long paragraphs of questions you might get on the Security Plus exam. Sometimes I think Security Plus is as much a reading comprehension exam as it is a security exam. So you do have to be ready for that. Uh, that's why I made the practice exams book. The questions here, uh, so they have certainly the same the same thinking process, but they are they are written in a way that's a little easier to do when we're in this live streaming type environment for those of you that are asking about that it might help you for these so if you aren't quite sure people are making the point could be one or the other maybe you're you're trying to figure out which one it is take a guess the one thing we do know of the exam is that you get points for answering right you get no points for answering wrong and they don't take points away from you for answering wrong so answering and guessing is a perfectly good strategy to go about. Never leave a question blank to be able to do this. Let's see how we answered this one. A network architect needs to offload web server encryption to increase the speed of a public web application. Which of the following would best fit this requirement? 62% of you say that's an SSL accelerator. But 26% of you, over a quarter of you, said a forward proxy is what you would use for this. A tie for third place between VPN concentrator and packet filter with 5% apiece. And coming in last at 2%, DDoS mitigation would be this. Well, let's see what the answer would really be. It would be, as uh, the 63% the of you, the majority have said, it's an SSL accelerator. You have a client out in the world connecting to a web server and doing this over HTTPS. Well, this means that your web server is going to have to handle all of the cryptographic functions for this particular application. For every single person connecting to the web server, this could create some overhead. So one of the ways that you can get rid of some of that overhead is to put in the middle of this conversation an SSL accelerator, where there would be HTTPS to the SSL accelerator. And since that SSL accelerator and web server are in your data center, it's a protected environment, they're literally sitting next to each other, you would then have HTTP, which is much easier for web servers to handle. There's no cryptographic overhead. There's nothing we have to worry about there. So that is one where uh, it's very common to do this. Now, these days, our, our web servers, the, the CPU cycles inside of them are getting a little bit better. We can support a little bit more. So some people are are getting rid of their SSL accelerators altogether. But it does help to have one of those in the middle can really, really help you being able to, to take advantage of that. Uh, and this means that piece of hardware does it very, very, very fast as well. It's designed to be an accelerator for this. Now, the, some folks in the chat room are going, it's sometimes people call it a TLS accelerator. No, they don't. Nobody describes this as TLS. What is it doing? It's accelerating TLS. So is it a TLS accelerator? It's not. It's an SSL accelerator. We've never called these things TLS for some reason. Nobody's really using SSL, by the way. SSL is an old, outdated protocol that has a number of uh, vulnerabilities associated with it. It's outdated. It hasn't been kept up. And we have, as an industry, effectively replaced it with TLS. So did we change the name of everything to say TLS? Nope. Didn't change anything to say TLS. Everything says SSL. I don't know. There it is. That's just the way we do things in this industry. So even though we say this is an SSL accelerator, it's really a TLS accelerator to be able to have that there. Is that misleading? It, there's a lot of things in this industry. We say one thing and mean another to have this there. When somebody's, we're trying desperately to turn the tide, you will see people use the term TLS accelerator. Do you see how hard it is to say that? 
Do you have a TLS accelerator or do you have an SSL accelerator? See how easy that is? That's why it's a problem. That's why we can't change the name is because SSL is too easy to say. We should have thought about that when we named the, the protocol. When we thought about TLS, it's too hard to say for all of this. So that's just the way the industry is, has done it. Maybe we'll eventually turn the tide and finally say TLS. I don't, I don't think that's true for this and be able to, to have that there. So hopefully you'll be familiar with all of these things too. Uh, let's see if we've got some time left. Uh, by the way, uh, if you are someone who is watching this video for continuing education unit credit, one of the things that you can do is uh, you can send me a message and I'll tell you exactly the process you should follow and make sure you follow this process to be able to receive a digitally signed email from me. You want to go to the top or the bottom of the Professor Messer website and you want to choose the Contact Us link. And that Contact Us link, you'll want to put your name, you want to put your email address, make sure that one is right because I'm emailing this back to you. There's a subject line, and if you could put that this is the January 2020 Security Plus Study Group, and if you could in the in the the anywhere in there in the subject line or in the main text of that message, put our super secret password of the month, which is SSL Accelerator, because it's driving people crazy that we still use that term. Why not use it? SSL Accelerator is our super secret code word of the month. If you follow those instructions, you have to follow those instructions. That's part of receiving this. That's the way I know you must have watched this. You are going to receive from me in about a week or so, sometimes two weeks, a email from me that is digitally signed that says you must have watched this study group. You can use it for one hour of CEU credit. That might be something that you can use to be able to do that. Follow those instructions and you'll be able to receive that email. I know that you don't have to use the email to be able to earn that credit. You can just tell CompTIA that you did it, but I'd like you to have something that you can use if they ever decide to audit you to be able to have that happen. Hopefully, that is something you can do. We've got time for another question. Let's get another one in before this party is over. This next question is an authentication question. It asks... A user has just signed for a delivery. What type of authentication was used? Was it somewhere you are, something you are, something you have, something you do, or something you know? So a user has just signed for delivery. What type of authentication was used? Was it somewhere you are, something you are, something you have, something you do, or something you know. If you think you know the answer, go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. See what it happens to be. This is one where you do have to know all of these different authentication types. So make sure that you are familiar with all of these, not just the one that you think it is. If any of these look unusual to you, make sure you're familiar with all of them. They're all in the same video anyway. So if you watch that one video, you're covered when it comes to all of these different authentications. So I want you to go through each of these and see if you happen to know what it is. If you think you know the answer, you can pop open your new browser window and go to professormesser.com slash QA and lock in your answer. This is a pretty simple question. If you get one like this on the exam, you'll be doing well. Two, two sentences, a user just signed for a delivery what type of authentication was used. Hopefully that's one that you're familiar with too, and being able to work through all of these. Uh, whenever I start going through and trying to figure out what do, what, what do I do on the exam for these, you may be able to break these up and get rid of the ones you know is definitely not the right answer. That may be something you can go through and get familiar with these as well. This is a uh, this is one where you do have to know these different types. These will come up a lot in meetings with security professionals when you're putting in a new firewall, you're putting in a new application, you're installing uh, a new system for this application. You have to know all of these different authentication types, and they will come up on your exam. Uh, CompTIA loves to ask questions about these different authentication types and making this happen. Hopefully, it's one you're familiar with, too. Let's see how you did on this one. A user just signed for delivery. 
So what type of authentication was used? How do we do? 60% said it's something you do. Well, is that the right answer, though? We're about to find out. We've got 12% and 11%, practically a tie for second, that say something you are and something you know. And then at 8 and 9% is something you have and somewhere you are. The majority of us that answer this question say, oh, it's something you do. But is that signing for delivery really something you do? It absolutely is. That's, that's when you really think about the different ways to authenticate with something you do. Probably the most common one is a handwriting. It's a signature. It's one of the most common ways until the last couple of years, probably one of the most common authentication methods used in the United States. Uh, because that's what people were using to authenticate credit card transactions. We would look at the back of the card. Did it match the signature they put down? That's the authentication. What a bad way to authenticate, by the way. Turns out didn't work very well. And uh, it turns out the that it works so poorly that the credit card company said, you know what, you can just stop checking now. It doesn't matter if it matches. We're, we've given up trying to guess. And they the reason they really decided to do that was not necessarily because a uh, chip and pin is on its way. It's because the people that are selling the product are ultimately the ones that are taking the risk. So this is one where the credit card companies, they're not the ones taking the risk. If somebody charges, there's credit card fraud, the credit card companies aren't the one paying that fraud. It's the people that sold the actual product. A lot of people don't realize that, I think. That credit card fraud, it's the company that got frauded that is stuck doing this, the credit card company just takes their money, whether it was something that was paid for properly or not. Uh, kind of a difficult situation, isn't it? But that's why handwriting analysis and writing something down and signing for something that we still do for deliveries and other things is a valid method. Sometimes you have to add additional or multi-factor to this. You may have to show ID along with your signature. You may have to, well, if you're at an address that's one authentication somewhere you are. Signing it might be the second authentication that you're using. So the signature may be the multi-factor authentication as we're signing this as something you do. That is where this one happens to be. So uh, you may think nobody uses this as a security measure. It's used every day. If you receive a UPS shipment, a FedEx shipment, we're still using these all the time. Is it a good security measure? Probably not. Do we use it? Yes, we do. Welcome to security. Good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. That's that's kind of how the industry works, isn't it? Uh, we just can't help ourselves. Uh, does it make sense? Nope. Are we doing it? Yep. That's a, a common frustration. That will be the rest of your security career, by the way. I can really think of nothing else that uh, that you'll have to do over and over again, but deal with these odd, ironic, frustrating dichotomies. It is constant if nothing else, and having those things there. All the questions today, by the way, came directly from the CompT exam objectives. So these CompT exam objectives are where you can find everything that's going to be in the exam. If it's in these exam objectives, you should know it. If it's not in these exam objectives, I wouldn't bother studying it. If you know everything on this set of exam objectives, you're going to pass your exam, no problem. I'm telling you straight up, that's how close CompTIA stays to these exam objectives. Absolutely know about these. We do one of these study groups every month. The next one's going to be February 26th is the next one. Of course, earlier in February, on the 4th and the 6th is the A-plus study groups that I do. Then I skip a week, and then we have on the 19th is our Network Plus study group, and on the 26th is the Security Plus study group. If you're watching this and you're, this, you're thinking, well, this is well past February of 2020, you can always find out when the next event is going to be by visiting my website and clicking the calendar link or going directly to professormesser.com slash calendar. Can you believe we did a whole hour of Q&A today? That's just the first part. This is the part where I ask you questions. We're going to do more Q&A, but you're going to ask me questions. In this next hour, I'll answer almost anything that you would like to ask. It doesn't have to be about CompTIA or Security Plus. It could be really about anything. And we'll see if I have an answer. Sometimes I do, sometimes not so much. The Security Plus course notes, of course, can be found on my website at professormesser.com slash securitycn. Practice exams are at securitype. 
You can, of course, find me on YouTube, Twitter, Instagram by typing in professormesser.com slash Twitter slash YouTube slash Instagram. You'll find out where those are. And don't forget to support the website if you're purchasing from Amazon by going to professormesser.com slash Amazon. Thanks for joining us for this first hour. Stick around. We've got the after show available. Thanks for joining us. And we will see you next time on the Security Plus Study Group. Let's see if I can get things going on this side. Here we go. I, you know, some people said I should stream this on Twitch uh, so we can donate tips. I don't take donations. So that's one of the big reasons I guess I haven't done that. It's just not uh, what I wanted to do. It's not really been the model or the style. So I've just never accepted donations. I want to give you, if you're paying something, if you're paying for a purchase of a uh, course notes, I want you to get something in return. Uh, if you, if you give me money, here's some practice exams. Here's a, uh, here's a thing. So uh, and by the way, watching the videos and there's ads there, you know, you're suffering through the ads. So some of this does come back to me. Don't worry. Uh, we're, we're, the lights are on. We're continuing to make this happen. Let's get the callers coming in. Let me get the, the shows going. I have to call into my own show. Before you can call into the show, I have to call into the show. So that's what we're going to do right now on this very compelling part of the study group called Watch Me Set Up the Calls on my call-in studio. It's going to beep for a second. It's going to make some noises. Uh, it's going to say something in the background there. I type in with uh, this. And then I type in a pin, which, uh, oops, did I do that right? Uh, and I did not. Uh, now I did it right. And she says, "Welcome." there we go. It all works. Got to like it when the whole thing comes together, don't we? If you would like to join us, uh, you can, of course, put questions in the chat room. I'll be glad to answer those. Uh, that's very easy to be able to put information in and get questions back and forth. You can also call in with what we call voice telephone communication. You're welcome to do that. In the United States, it's a toll-free number, 855-785-RJ45. West of the Rockies, you can dial 855-785-7545. This number can also be used internationally using Skype because Skype will allow you to call toll-free numbers for no Skype minutes. An absolutely free phone call on Skype. You put a plus one at the beginning, plus one, 855-785-7545, and you can call in on Skype for free from wherever you happen to be. So that's a good way to make that happen. So we'll take some questions from the chat room. Some of you have already uh, put a few things in there, having those things. We already talked about the donations. I appreciate you asking. I, I really do appreciate you asking. It's so nice of you to even mention it. It's just not a thing I do, and it's, uh, it's intentional. It's not something where I haven't thought about it. I just don't want to be taking donations from people. Um, just a, It's me being weird, I guess, which is fine. I'm perfectly comfortable with being weird. Uh, it's just how I've uh, worked through those. Uh, how often do the exam objectives change? The exam objectives from CompTIA don't generally change once they are published. Sometimes they will release an update that might correct a misspelling. It might correct where they didn't put in a carriage return or they need to change the wording of something that was not quite right. But they didn't ever change the actual meaning of what they had in there. So you will almost never see changes on the Security Plus, Network Plus, or A Plus. Once they put them out, they're pretty much locked in stone. That's because if they change them, imagine every publisher in the world that has ever created content for that particular certification will now have to go back and change everything. So nobody wants that. Once they lock it in, that's pretty much it. The only time they ever change them is when they release a new version of the exam that usually happens about every three years or so. So that is one where if you are if you're looking for instance the next iteration of security plus we know that the current version the SY0501 came out I can even bring this up on the screen so that we can all see it together this current version of the security plus exam came out on October the 4th of 2017 now I know that they will come out with a new updated exam about three years from now. So you can think that's October 4th, 2020. That's this year, at the, in October of this year. 
But what CompTIA tends to do is give about a six-month overlap where both exams will be available so that they just don't cut you off. Maybe you've been studying for the 501. What, it just goes away in October? Nope, they keep it up for another six months to give you plenty of time to take that exam, which means I would expect the SYZ or 501 to be around until about April of 2021. Now, could CompTIA change that? They could. So always check in with CompTIA. This is just what I've seen them do in the past. This has traditionally been what they have done. So that is one to be able to have that capability, and that's one where you would help with those as well. Another question in the chat room, then we'll go back to, uh, we'll go to the phone lines. I see some folks calling in, so thank you for holding. A uh, question uh, there, we were talking about that last question. One of the last questions just before the end of the study group was about SSL acceleration. Uh, but can't proxies also handle encryption? They certainly can because the question, uh, if we back up and have a look at it, asked specifically, and yes, I, I specifically was thinking of that as well, of offloading encryption and proxies can do that but the option that i gave you in this was a forward proxy and this was one where i was trying to increase the speed of a public web application even if the company is an incoming they would not be using a forward proxy for that they would be using a reverse proxy to be able to avoid that encryption piece and reverse proxy was not one of the answers available forward proxy was Forward proxy is what you use if you were inside of an organization going out to many, many other sites. But for people coming inbound to your web server, you'd be using a reverse proxy. But yes, proxy would work, but that was not one of the available options. Specifically, that's why it was not one of the available options on there. Let's get to the phone lines. Make sure I've got the phone lines. More probably weren't even hearing me because they were not potted up, but we'll go to 832. Hello, caller. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Caller. Name, where are you calling from? I'll see. Hello. You'll want to listen in. There's a little bit of a delay. Hello, caller. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Uh, hello. My name is Chris. I'm calling in from San Antonio, Texas. Hi, Chris. Uh, first and foremost, I want to thank Hey, I want to thank you, Professor Messer. I recently got my network bus, and I used your uh, coursework for that, and now nice. I'm studying for my sec plus, so you've been a great aide. Thank okay. you, sir. Congratulations on your network plus. Um, what question do you have? I wanted to ask, so in some of your previous uh, study groups and such, you mentioned the questions can be really wordy. I think at one point you said it can be even a page or a bit more than that, and they can be very difficult to understand in regards to that sense. Cer certainly so a I paragraph, to yes. I took the net okay, I took the uh, net plus, and I was wondering if you could maybe compare how the questions would be to the sec plus so I can kind of understand how difficult those questions will be on the sec plus. I think it's comparable. I think Security Plus probably has a little bit more wordy questions. But you'll notice on Network Plus, and even to some degree on A Plus, but A Plus is not even close to, to these. So let's just focus on Network Plus and Security Plus. Network Plus tends to ask questions that are, I would say, very similar to the, the wordiness of questions we saw today, where here's a scenario. They don't just ask you, uh, what protocol do you use for this? For what protocol do you use for encrypted terminal communication? That's it, like one sentence. Instead, they give you a scenario. Uh, uh, we have uh, Sam is connecting to a Linux server from a remote location and wants to ensure that none of her communication can be seen by anyone else. What protocol should Sam use? So it's the same question, but it's this much longer scenario that they tend to put in. And that's about the, the link that you would find on a Network Plus. They don't go into a lot of other detail. Security Plus adds a couple more sentences. Maybe they'll add a breakdown of, of some of the, the packets that went back and forth. Maybe they'll show you a diagram, but it's a little bit more detailed than what you would find on Network Plus. If you've already gotten adjusted to that, that style that you saw on Network Plus, you'll be ready for Security Plus when it comes at you. You won't see much of a difference there at all. Fantastic. I'm glad to hear that because I didn't think the Network Plus was super uh, difficult. So I'm glad to hear that because I was really worried about the Spec Plus. I think you'll be fine. And if you look at there's a, there's a couple of publishers that are publishing Security Plus uh, practice exams. Grab one of those if you're if you're finally you're really nervous about it. You're just not sure that might help you at the end uh, when you're ready to take that exam. 
All right, definitely will do. Uh, if it's okay, I wanted to ask one more thing about sure. HMAC. Yeah. Um, so I've looked a bit into HMAC and I've, you know, watched through your video course and read a textbook about it. And I really don't understand why you would use HMAC for something like SRTP, right? You'd use AES encryption and then you'd HMAC. Why not just use either asymmetric and do both in one or just add a hash inside of AES and you would still get the uh, integrity that you'd get from HMAC, right? The, this, is the, this is the thing people go back and forth with when they are designing these applications, which is in what cases do I use these different uh, encryptions, authentication codes, uh, hashing, and trying to make all of this happen at one time. Um, it depends on the application that's in use. And you're, you're right. In fact, in, in some cases, like over the network, we don't have enough CPU cycles and time to be able to use these very complex algorithms that combine all of these different things together to provide us with authentication and hashing all in one across the network. But there may be a single authentication process that takes place at the very beginning of that where that might make sense. Um, I, in fact, the cases of HMAC being used, um, I know that within whenever, if you're bringing up an IPsec tunnel, for instance, you're going to be using HMAC. It's very useful to use that there, at least at the very beginning uh, on those first two phases. Um, are there other places you would see it? I don't know offhand. There might be an application somebody writes where they might not. But I think if you're doing anything with IPsec, you'll probably see it pop up. All right. Uh, thank you very much. I don't, I still don't quite get it, but I, I understand where you're coming from. And I think more of that will come as I gain work experience and actually, you know, deal with this in the real life instead of just in a textbook or in a video. Um, so as I mentioned, I, I already took the net plus and hopefully I'll pass the spec plus. I was thinking about taking the A plus because I don't have technical experience, right? I've never worked in a, a technician or a help desk position. I'm just graduating college. Do you think that would be a right track? Cause I know you have a video series on a plus from your, experience right do you think i should pursue that even though i know employers wouldn't really care given that that wouldn't be the direct field of work i'm going into i think you you hit right on the head when what do the what are the employers looking for so this may be a good opportunity for you to start building the spreadsheet and i recommend people do this is you know that you're look you're working towards a particular job if you're in school right now you're probably working towards a entry level position somewhere in an organization these will generally be help desk positions sure. maybe a knock position maybe a sock position a security operations center but most often it's going to be help desk or knock type jobs this may be a good time to go out to the big employer post sites Go to the LinkedIn's and the uh, Dice.com's. Start looking around at what jobs are available in your area for those types of positions and see what they're looking for. They might say, we want a minimum of a formal degree and an A-plus certification. Or they may say, we don't care if you have a formal degree, you have an A-plus. Or they may say, we just want a formal degree. And they don't care about certification. Every employer is a little bit well different. Um, and it's useful if you can get a kind of feel for that and find out overall what are people looking for. And then you at least know if I'm going to invest the time in getting the A+, plus, is this going to give me a return? Well, in the local area I'm in, I'm in San Antonio, Texas, in a fairly metropolitan area. And so I've been going through salary negotiations and things like that. Um, and I haven't found anyone who was like, uh, because the positions I'm applying for are, and the positions I'm getting callbacks from, so I don't think I'm misled in this, are, you know, a, a bit higher. Like I've, I have an interview coming up for a system engineer position, things like that. And so none of these people have told me, hey, you need an A+, plus, right? The, right? They wanted me to get spec plus. They wanted me to get next plus, but no one really asked for the A+. Plus. I'm asking more for my own personal development, right? Because I don't have that hands-on experience, do you think actually learning about like data cables and SCSI cables and that more technical thing that you don't deal with in tech both and was only beneficial? It, it may not be. For instance, my last position was one where I was dealing with firewalls. I needed to know all the things that were on Security Plus. I needed to have a, har a really good foundation in networking. But there was never a time when I needed to size a power supply in a computer. I needed to know the fundamentals of Windows, but I wasn't installing the operating system or upgrading it or managing it. I was only using it. 
to be able to load these applications. So I needed to understand how to install an application as administrator. Well, you right mouse click and choose run as administrator. That was the depth of the operating system knowledge that I needed to know. Um, I had my A+. Plus. I knew more than that. I can build my own computers. I like doing that, but it's not what I need, not what I needed to know for to do that particular job. If an employer is not specifically saying you need an A+, plus, you're probably not going to have to worry about that. But there are going to be questions that come up during your normal operation in those jobs that deal with Windows, that deal with Linux. And the more you know about those operating systems, the better you're going to be in those positions. Fantastic. So thank you for your time and thank you for all the content you put out. Thank you very much. Thanks, Chris. Best of luck. That's a good place to be to find a job at San Antonio area. Uh, if you're going to professormesser.com, then you are kind of, I think that's where my surfer is. I think my surfer is in San Antonio. Uh, maybe in Dallas. It's somewhere in Texas. You're connecting to Texas when you're connecting to my server. I'm not in Texas. This just happens to be where it works. Uh, I love the cloud. Let's go to 703. Hello, caller. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hello? Caller, caller. Hi. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Yeah. Hi. Hi. My name is Victor. Thanks for calling. And What's I'm your calling question? I'm from uh, Virginia. Oh, great. Uh, yes. Uh, I have a couple of questions, uh, uh, Professor Messer. Um, I need, um, I'm starting for Security Plus, but um, to kind of understand the concept, I think uh, based on my style of learning, I need more hands on. So I was trying to see if you recommend any resources. There, there's a few for, for hands-on, and this is sort of a challenge on A+, on Network+, Plus, on Security+. Plus. I always tell you you should do four things to study. You should get a good book. You should watch some good videos. You should do plenty of Q&A, and you should get plenty of hands-on. There's a lot of options for Security+. Plus. I put a number of recommendations uh, for hands-on on my website. If you go to the Security Plus menu at the top of the page, I, uh, really for A plus network plus and security plus I have a, I have a recommendations link there that will take you to a page with the things that I recommend um, these are things and in fact for hands-on there's not a lot of choices for security plus but there are a couple available that would be third-party labs as some people in the chat room have already mentioned uh, there are a number of books that have some hands-on labs in them as well so as you're going through these topics they take you through some labs to make that happen. And of course, in my videos, when I talk about using Traceroute and Dig and Nmap, I'm running those scans and running those utilities with the same type of functions that you could do on your side. So you can follow along with the video as well. So there's a couple places you can go. It is difficult to find really good labs. Um, so it's one of those where you have to hunt around, find the one that works for you. I put a couple of recommendations on my site, but you may find others out there as well. Oh, okay. That is uh, that is really helpful. Thank you for that. We'll certainly uh, check out more uh, your website for that. Now, um, the second part of my question is that um, I don't have any uh, IT background per se, but um, how likely or uh, if I just get security plus um, to land entry level job? Because I think that you have said it's very difficult to kind of do entry level with uh, even without certification, without experience. It's, it's one of those situations where if you're walking into a certification, uh, where you're walking into an interview, it would be good to have four different things available on your list of resources. One of them would be a formal education. And it doesn't necessarily need to be one in IT, but having a two or four year degree tells an employer you would you're able to stick this thing out for two to four years and and come up with that final degree. There's value to that to the employers. Whether there's actual value, Sometimes that doesn't matter. The employers think it's valuable. Therefore, it is in that particular scenario. The other one is industry certifications. It would be great to have an industry certification next to it so that if somebody shows up with the same type of formal education you do, well, you have a little bit more than that person did, and you can combine that with some industry certifications. The third is to have some practical experience. And this, of course, is the catch-22 for that entry-level position they want you to have experience, but you can't get experience until they give you a job. 
that's sort of the normal thing people always go through when they're getting that first job. Uh, but getting experience doesn't necessarily mean that you have a full-time job that you're doing this. You may be wanting to do uh, a part-time job maybe you're able to get that has something to do with technology. Maybe you are someone who is volunteering at a local nonprofit, making sure that their operating systems remain up to date, making sure their antivirus is installed and up to date, making sure that they have backups and they're protected in case something happens. That is legitimate experience that you can put on a resume that doesn't necessarily mean that you got paid for it, but you definitely put in the time. And that's something you could put on a resume and make that happen. The fourth thing I would put, I didn't know, I used to say you need three things, but now I think you need four things. And I mentioned this because it's so easy to do, is it helps if you know somebody who already works there. It doesn't have to be the person you're interviewing with either. I always give an example of this because it's a great way to not only know people in your industry, but it's also a great way to learn new things, is to attend a local user group in your area. Go to a Microsoft user group. Go to a Cisco user group. Go to any type of technology user group because the people in technology at these companies are also attending those user group meetings. That is a great place to meet people, get on their LinkedIn. They might even ask you to send them your resume because they get a finder's fee if they bring you into the organization. And being able to go into an interview and say, tell somebody, oh yeah, I know this person who works in IT from the Microsoft user group, they know there's a connection there and there's a level of trust they can put into something like that. It's a very, very powerful resource and it's one that I don't think many people take advantage of. Um, I had probably 15 different jobs throughout my entire IT career. The first job I got without knowing anybody who worked there. But every position I had after that, some of the positions were internal to a company, some were outside where I went to a different company. Every other job, I knew someone who worked there, and I was able to say that during the interview process. It makes a big difference, so don't dismiss that. Definitely think about getting all four of those. Oh, okay, uh, that is uh, great advice. Um, I really appreciate it. Um, we'll we'll look into it. Um, yes, I, 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 I'm actually um, doing a um, system management degree, system operation management. Great. I'm almost done with it. So looking to okay, uh, and you have mentioned that the formal education is is important. So I'm trying to get that out of the way. So um, and. We will do um, uh, the company that work is kind of a little challenged because they kind of outsource the IT. Um, so that's, that's there. It's, um, it's not direct. So it's, um, so that's a little challenge there. I guess. There's always a, there's always going to be a challenge in some way. There's going to be one thing that always tends to put things uh, off to the side. But don't let uh, somebody else's policies, processes, or anything relating to what they are doing with those jobs uh, make you think that you're not ready for the position. I've seen some job postings that are just ridiculous because the people who posted the job didn't understand what the employer was looking for. Send your resume anyway. Uh, it doesn't matter what they think they need. You should always get your name into the running and have them decide whether you uh, fit that particular role or not. Uh, best of luck. Thanks for the call. That's that's one I think can help anybody when you're going through the process of trying to find that next job and what they're what you're trying to do. Let's go back to the phones. Uh, the 240 area code. Hello, caller. Which name were you calling from? Hello, Professor Mercer. Can you hear, can you hear me? You sound great. What can we do for you? Oh, uh, so my name is Henry and I'm calling from D.C. Um, I just want I like about two months ago, I believe I called you and I had questions for you. Um, I just wanted to uh, call and say thank you because I already passed the exam. Nice. Congratulations. And, um, I do want to say thank you for all the hard work that you put us, the put out there, you know, to share with the world. Um, and I kind of wanted to share a little bit of like things that um, the upcoming uh, students want to do when they take the exam. Yeah, obviously we can't say specific uh, things about the questions that are on the exam, but if you had to pick two or three things where you could give someone a tip before they walk in the door, what would you think those would be? Definitely. I uh, What I want to say is that um, I think like 
if you study the materials very well and um, you go and take the exam, is to actually read the question and understand what they're asking. Um, then reading the, all of the answers because some, there's there's sometimes where they ask you a question and uh, when you look at the answers, it's like you know the answer, but you're unsure. So I think like trusting your instinct is very important. Um, the reason why I say this is because I've had to I failed twice before I actually passed this exam, and I realized that following your instincts actually gives you a true answer as well. Um, and uh, like I said, like making sure you read the question and read all of the answers, because even though sometimes you think it doesn't make sense that this is the answer, you you don't you cannot think on your own way, but you have to think the way that CompTIA is wording the questions for you to actually answer. So that's like my suggestions I wanted to share to everyone. One of the things that always surprised me on the exam is I'd be working through one on the Security Plus. I'd start the question, and in my mind, I thought, well, I know where they're going with this. And then I got to the end of the question, and it was a completely different question than what I was thinking. So you really do have to, you're absolutely right, read through the entire question before you're starting to commit on what the answers are going to be, because that could absolutely throw you off. Congratulations, Henry, on your Security Plus certification. What is next for you? Yeah, thank you. Um, that's uh, the next step that I'm trying to figure um, since um, I was thinking to probably go with uh, CEH or probably IDLE because I believe IDLE is quite easy to, to take, I think. I still need to do a little bit more research, but um, um, I know I think it's um, a little bit easier for, to do the IDLE, but at the same time, I'm like, I know CEH is like probably the next thing right after Security Plus especially because I don't have any network networking background. So to me, it was super hard to actually pass the exam. So I, had, I actually studied for this for like four months already um, before I can actually make it happen. <laughs> well, either one of those, so, uh, yeah. that's what the employers in your area are looking for. Absolutely, that's a, that's a great direction to go. Uh, best of luck. Let us know how that goes. Yeah. Thank you. I appreciate it, Professor Mason. Thanks for calling. That's... That's all in his particular area of the world also in that Maryland, D.C., Virginia area. Uh, security certifications are the rage. That's what people want to see from the employers want to see up there. So that makes perfect sense that you would le uh, lean in that direction. Let's go to 661. Hello, caller. Which name were you calling from? Caller, caller. Are you there? Are you muted, caller? It's 661 area code in Los Angeles, California. Maybe so. We'll have to see if you're able to get back with us. So we'll shift gears a bit and go to the 917 area code. Hello, caller. Which name are you calling from? Yes, hello. My name is Christopher, and I want to say thank you to all IT students everywhere. You have been a savior to everyone. So thank you, Professor oh, Messer. Um, thank you for, very much. Well, you have a question for us? Yes, I, um, I have a bachelor's degree in cybersecurity, uh, but I feel it's very hard to get employed, so I am looking towards my certifications. I want to see any advice. Do you recommend me start with the A-plus certification, Network Plus, and Security Plus, or jump straight into the Security Plus um, certification? And also, what IT position should I be looking for for experience? Security Plus uh, or security roles in general are a tough one because the, the type of roles you will find are not generally entry-level positions. They're usually positions you would move into once you get through things like a security back or a networking background. Very common to find all the people who were doing networking are now suddenly in security. It's, so it's a natural progression. And there are not a lot of entry-level jobs in security when you, re when you compare them to other parts of the organization. For example, the help desk has a lot of entry-level positions. Networking, perhaps a network operations center may have entry-level positions. Uh, security positions are a little bit more difficult to find. So that's why I, I always tell people, keep your eyes open for those. If you do happen to find an entry-level security position, you should absolutely go after that because they are relatively rare compared to everything else. And that's why I think a lot of people want to start 
on a help desk or in a operations center so they can learn more about the infrastructure, learn more about networking. If you're going into security, you have to know a lot about networking. So it's good to have a networking foundation that you can bring to the table if you're finally in the position to move into security. Because security, though, everybody needs security and the, the number of jobs for security keeps going up and up. There's not enough people. So we're starting to see a little bit more movement on the entry level side where people are willing to take uh, a risk, put somebody entry level into a, a security operations center or another security environment and move them up through the ranks that way. I would think most of the time, though, people are moving up through the ranks uh, through doing something like network administration, server administration, and then from there, they're moving into security. Uh, even then, that's uh, getting those security roles can be very difficult. So they need somebody knowledgeable if you're getting into IT security. It's one of those things, I, I think they don't tell you that before you start getting those security degrees and getting those security certifications. They don't tell you uh, there's not a lot of security entry-level jobs out there, just so you know. Um, and that's why I think you'll notice that your your security uh, formal education you got with cybersecurity wasn't just about security. There was a lot of things wrapped around it, and that's why, because you'll probably be starting on a different scope, and then you'll be moving eventually into that security role. Perfect. Thank you so much. Also, do you recommend I start with my A-plus certification or jump straight into my Security Plus certification? This is really depends on what the employers are looking for. Uh, I mentioned in an earlier call, and this is really a good idea for anybody to do this, is go out to those different sites that have those job roles and make a spreadsheet. Find out what their minimum requirements are. Are they looking for a formal education? Are they looking for an industry certification? What industry certifications are they looking for? And then what else do they have in that list of things they want? And get an idea, because I mentioned if you're in the Maryland, D.C., Virginia area, the requirements will be very, very different than somebody who is in the San Antonio area. It's a completely different scope of things. People are looking for different requirements. And sometimes it's very unique to the organization. There may be a company in your area that is doing something very specific, and they're looking for a very specific kind of 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 set of requirements for someone to come in for a job. So this is more of an answer that I can't give. It's more of an answer the employer has to give. And it's one where you're going to have to go do a little bit of research to figure out what that happens to be. Perfect. Thank you so much for your advice. I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Christopher. That's one where I would love to be able to answer that question. Hey, should I get a CEH, an A plus or an idol? I don't know. What do the employers want? I mean, I'm assuming in this case that the employee, what you're trying to do is get that job or get a better job. That's what you would like to know um, is what are they asking for? Whatever they want, that's what I'm going to go get. So if they're asking for A+, plus, I'm going to go get an A+. Plus. If they're asking for idle, I'm going to go get an idle. Uh, is, is that going to help me at all? Is an IT infrastructure library certification going to help me? It's not not for an entry-level position. Do the employers think it's going to help me? Yes, they do. And that's really what matters. Uh, there was a sort of a watchword uh, throughout your career is uh, the way that you are successful, the way that you uh, have a very good annual review, a way that you continue to be successful in your job is you make your boss happy. That was it. That's your, that is your job description. You make your boss happy. And when the boss is happy, they tend to be happy with whatever you're doing. So make sure your boss is happy. If they want you to get an IT infrastructure library certification, absolutely that's what you do. Uh, you may find that nothing in that certification applies to anything you're doing in your help desk role. doesn't matter. Your boss is happy. So uh, is that, does that make sense? Does that? No, it makes no sense at all. Of course, that doesn't. Why? Yeah, well, that's just how it works. Welcome to the way that works in, the, in how most organizations work anyway. Uh, and ultimately, you're going to end up getting the certifications and the things that will help you personally get to where you would like to be. Uh, sometimes getting that IT infrastructure library certification gives you the leverage to work towards Security Plus. So you never know 
what, the way these things are going to work out. Let's go back to the phones. 410 area code. Hello, caller. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, Professor Messer. My name is Brian, and I, too, am from uh, the D.C. area in Maryland. Welcome. Thanks. Uh, thanks so much for all your help. In uh, 2019, I was able to get my A-plus and Network Plus. Nice. And uh, I can confirm that this area, the employers definitely want Security Plus for sure. Um, for sure. So I am working on that right now. I... It was going along great, and then I hit the cryptography and encryption <laughs> section, and uh, I'm really having trouble wrapping my head around yeah. things like initialization vectors, right. and um, I, I'm, I don't really get it. They're kind of like, they're hard to put my fingers on, and I can't really understand what they're doing. Yeah, this is sort of the problem when you get into uh, technology that you can't touch it becomes a lot more difficult to try to find a way to learn these things. The best thing I can tell you to do with cryptography is just start using it. And we don't tend to use it, at least not directly. You know, if you've ever paid for something online, you've used HTTPS, but you never really used it. You were just a user of it. So what I tell a lot of people is if you want to learn about asymmetric encryption. You want to learn about digital signatures. You want to get a feel for how to use these things and how they work. I tell people, go get, go get download PGP or GPG and uh, build yourself a pair of keys and start communicating with somebody else using those keys. Encrypt a message, digitally sign a message, encrypt and digitally sign a message. Do all three of those as three separate things so that you could start seeing how are those protocols being actually used. Uh, in fact, if anybody who's listening would like to send me a message that has been encrypted, that has been digitally signed or both, you're welcome to do that. You send it to james at professormesser.com, and I'll be more than happy to uh, read your message and if you have your key on a public key server, I will send you a message back that is encrypted, digitally signed, and or both. So it's another way to start getting some real hands-on work. Another thing you might want to think about doing is if you have a way to set up IPsec or at least see someone setting up IPsec. There's tons of videos of people setting it up on IPsec tunnel. That's a great way to see... Uh, the phase one and all of the different things they put in for phase one, the things they put in for phase two. And you start to see these terms pop up. Oh, they're using Diffie-Hellman for that. That means they must be using Diffie-Hellman at both sides to be able to come up with a symmetric key that they can use without sending that over the network. I saw that in a video somewhere. So you'll start to see these things being actually used. Um, in some cases, it's a little more difficult because some of these security technologies are not things that you would see actually used. You wouldn't see some of the block ciphers that you have to know. It's hard to see that actually in use and to configure because it's part of an application that somebody built. But you could do probably a, a huge chunk of those things, just the descriptions of some of the labs I just gave you that are kind of real world things to do are great ways to watch the encryption working. You're building your own keys. You, you really can see, oh, here's my private key and here's my public key. And it, for, it starts to really solidify itself in your brain. That may be a good way to go about uh, tackling these one at a time to see how that works for you. Okay. Great. That uh, that makes a lot of sense. I will certainly do that. Sounds good. Thanks, uh, Brian. Can I ask one more oh, thing? Oh, sure, yeah. Are you playing any classic WoW? I am not. I, in fact, I, I technically speaking do not have a valid subscription at the moment for World of Warcraft. Wow, okay. I know. It's shame on me. But uh, it's sort of intentionally done because I'm in the process of writing these two new books for A+. I'm doing practice exam books for A+, right now. Um, and I just get sucked in way too easy as I'm sitting here in the studio. Uh, it, if it's, it would be much better sometimes if World of Warcraft did not have a Mac client. That would be so much better for me. But they do, and it's so easy for me to click over to that. So I don't actually have it right now. Right. Uh, but, boy, I, I remember the good old days. I was there at the very beginning, um, and uh, I, I've been watching some of the uh, the Twitch of people playing it, and it brings back a lot of great memories. It'd be something to jump into right. once I finally get some time. 
I know how you feel because I canceled my subscription when I started studying for <laughs> Sec Plus. So it's, it's I sometimes understand. you have to do it. It's it's one of those things. But we yeah, will get thanks, back Professor to it. Messer. Thanks, Brian. That's one of all the, the things we have to suffer through for the art of of Security Plus. Uh, you have to make it happen. Uh, I will say though, I do get a couple of hours of Xbox in every once in a while, so it's not a complete turn everything off. Uh, but 651 area code, thanks for calling. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hello, caller. I hear uh, you. Hello. There. Hello. Hi. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi. My name is uh, Levan. I am calling from uh, Minneapolis, Minnesota. Hi, Levan. Thank, mm -hmm. thank you for calling. What can we do for you? Hi. I want to say thank you because I passed my security class about two weeks ago. Nice. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Your videos and exams, practice exams were really, really, very helpful. Great. Great to hear it. So is there a... Uh, like, go ahead with your question. I'd like to add... What is that? I'm sorry. Go ahead. I didn't mean to interrupt you. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. So I'd like to say that your exam was really way harder than the actual one. <laughs> This is one of those that the Security Plus exam, of course, can be completely random. There's a completely random set of questions they're going to ask on the exam. You never know what you're going to get. I built my practice yeah. exams to kind of emulate every possible scenario of an exam question that you might get. Uh, and it's good that I think if your exam ended up being easier than that, I think that I've accomplished that. It was the first two of your practice exams. I really failed, like 60%. <laughs> I wasn't even cracking to the 75 or the 85, you know? <laughs> but but the, it seems so like it that, all worked out for you in the end. Is there a particular, if you had, you had to give people one recommendation before walking in the room of things they should absolutely know about, where would you tell people to focus? Oh, first of all, I think you should uh, focus on the practice exams watch your videos, you know, but most importantly, on the exam day, uh, this is what helped me. I had to read fast. I had to read it twice, the questions. Uh, most of the questions that I saw on the security class, in my case, I know everyone is everyone's different, but in my case, it wasn't even that wordy, most of the questions. I know we're not supposed to talk about the content of the questions, right. but they weren't that wordy or paragraph like as most of the people who are calling us we're talking about or as you have talked about it uh, in earlier steady groups it sounds like you got a good mix of questions then i have other people that will send me notes yeah. and say it was i had to read and read time management i think is a pretty important thing on the it exam was, how did that, you do with time management? time management yes i had like 20 25 minutes left oh wow at the end so i had to go back you know, and I think the practical questions, the practical, the practice based questions were, were really very really helpful. So getting information uh, from the performance based goals. questions helped you with the multiple choice then you mean? Yes. yes. Great strategy. A uh, great strategy. Well, congratulations. I, and uh, do you have an idea of what you're doing next? Is it you working towards a particular job or is there another certification on the horizon? I uh, I actually have a degree from, uh, from my home country and moved here. And, you know, it was kind of tough for me to find a job here because my degree was from outside country. I used to be a teacher back home, the university lecturers. I used to teach to be the science, you know. So none of that could fly here. So my first focus was, like, get the certification. So I had to start with Security Plus. And now every other job listing that I look at is looking for CCNA or MCAC, and I'm like, give me a break. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's probably one of the major requirements from a lot of employers. They love the Microsoft certifications. They love the Cisco certification. So you really can't go wrong. It sounds like you're heading exactly the right direction for this. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Appreciate the call. That's that's always good to hear, too. 
uh, it's not just Security Plus. There's a direction to moving and getting that next thing on the list. There's always going to be a next thing, by the way, that never tends to stop in your entire career. Uh, let's go to 559. Hello, caller. Which name are you calling from? Caller, caller. 559. California. It says Fresno, but you never know where they're calling from. Hello, hello caller. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hello, hello. Hi, you're way back there. Do you have a question? And yeah, I'm, uh, I'm calling to thank you very much for... Um... Oh, we All that you're doing with the uh, the the security plus videos. Oh, you're hearing yourself on the delay. You can turn off the the actual oh, computer and listen right. into the phone. There's a little bit of a delay there. I'm still trying to fight with it. Yeah, I'm, well, say that again, please. <laughs> well, do you have a? Well, I'm glad. Uh, th thank you so much for that. Do you have a question? Yeah, I'm looking at your. Um, I bought, actually bought your your. Your questions, and I'm looking at um, AAP, which is stock. Oh, you're fading out just a little bit there. It doesn't sound like we're able to make that one one work. You may want to try calling back, and if you have a headset or a microphone, that would be great. And there go the lights. So that's always good. We lose power. And I think that, what in the world? Let's see how this is going to go. Uh, back to, let's see how my stream, the stream is fine. Let's see if we're really going anywhere, though. I think we are. But I did lose my lights. Let's see. Let's. I'm waiting for, let's go live on this and let's see what it looks like. On here. So, well, there you go. It is a DDoS when we had this. My power has failed. It will be coming on in just a moment. Um, we will see this pop on in just a second if everything goes well. I'm going to listen in uh, and wait to see if my generator kicks in. But at least my network connection is still up and having this here. Um, we did miss that call, though. And there's my stream status is poor. We're going to see how this works out. I'm listening in to see if I get that back up and running. And I won't know because my lights are actually on a different system that will not automatically turn on. It looks like it came right back though. So the generator didn't have to kick in because everything popped right back up again. Let's try this again now with, <laughs> with lights. Was it the Canadians that hacked me? I don't think so. They like me. That's what Mrs. Professor Musser's family said anyway. Maybe they were not really being truthful with me. YouTube says that I have a poor stream status, but I'm looking at my live stream and I think we're okay. So we'll see how things go there. Yeah, we could have turned on the fireplace, although it's getting warm in here. These lights are LED, but they still tend to heat up. So that's good. YouTube says our stream is healthy, so we're going to go with that, and we're going to see what happens and see if we can still connect in to our phone callers at the 443 area code. Hello, caller. What's your name? Where are you calling from? John, I'm calling from Maryland. Hey, John, what's your question? Hey, so I recently got a contract through a DOD company to work on base. Um security clearance and all already done nice the issue i'm having is they need me they need me to get security plus within two weeks oh um yeah i'm using your videos and everything um there are a few other options as well but i'm wondering if you have any tips and pointers like which part of your video should i focus more on than the other two weeks is any a remarkably aggressive schedule uh, as you probably figured out. Yeah. <laughs> um, what I would do is get your exam objectives, and that is going to be your main checklist for everything you're going to study for the next two weeks. I would recommend printing it out, uh, and you're going to have to go through topics on there. If you've ever heard of it, if you're sort of familiar with it, 
maybe make a note. But the things that you've just never heard of before, dive into those as, far, as fast as you can and kind of get an overall breakdown of everything that's in those exam objectives so that you're at least familiar with the nomenclature. You've recognized the word. You understand what the difference is between these technologies that are being thrown at you. And, and some are not even technologies. It's just understanding what these terms mean so that you can at least, if a question comes up, you could at least logically break down what they're talking about. Uh, two weeks doesn't give you a lot of time. You could, of course, go through every video Get a good book. You're not going to have much time for hands-on. Uh, so just go through as much of that content as you can. And I think the exam objective should be your main checklist. Okay. Now, now when you say exam objectives, is, so does every exam have different objective, objectives it points towards? And there's like a breakdown I can view? or Their CompTIA is very different in how they provide this content. It's not like Microsoft or Cisco where they just give a wide overview of things you have to know. CompTIA tech lists out every single topic you need to know that you could possibly be asked on the exam. They obviously can't ask you everything that's on this list of exam objectives, but they have an extensive list of objectives. I realize you can't see this um, on the phone that you're calling in on, but those that are listening, I'm going to bring up the exam objectives for the SY0501 just so you can get a feel for what this, this looks like. So on my screen, let's bring this up. Let's put me in there. Here's the exam objectives for the 501. And it will even give you, a, it'll tell you there are six different domains in the exam objectives. And it tells you on the exam what the percentage is going to be from each domain. So at least you get a feel for knowing, well, the cryptography questions are only going to be 12% of the exam because that's all there is in that domain six. And then they go through every single thing you need to know. For example, section 1.1 says, given a scenario, analyze indicators of compromise and determine the type of malware. And then they give you a list of every single piece of malware you need to know about. Viruses, crypto malware, ransomware, worm, Trojan, rootkit, keylogger, adware, spyware, bots, rat, logic bomb, and backdoor. For your exam, you need to know what all those things are. You don't need to know more than what's on this list. And you certainly shouldn't study less than what is on this list. But that's a very precise, specific grouping. And they stay very close to this on the exam. If you get any questions about compromise and malware, it's going to be a question that involves those specific topics from the exam objectives. Awesome, awesome. Well, thankfully, uh, crypto is only 12% of that. So hopefully, yeah. I won't have too many issues. That is a benefit. If it's somebody, if you got two weeks, that's <laughs> definitely gives you an idea of where you should focus your studies. All right. Awesome. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for everything you've done for the IT world. Best of luck in the next two weeks, John. All right. Thank you. Have a good one. That's, that's a challenge. Uh, these things happen, though, all the time where employers say, you need to get this done quick. Go, go, go. Uh, are you going to be able to get it done quick? It's a good question. I don't know. Uh, to have those things there becomes a little bit of a challenge, doesn't it, to make that happen? Uh, let's go back to the phones. Two weeks, can you imagine? 240 area code. Hello, caller. Uh, if I click the right button, there we go. 240. Hello, caller. Which name are you calling from? Uh, hello, my name is Mick. Uh, I'm not sure there's a lot of 240s today. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe not. What can uh, yeah, we do for you? From the, I'm from that, uh, I'm from that Maryland area as well. Uh, and actually, to do uh, the security plus requirement is so ridiculous that there are jobs that are basic like help desk requirements and they want a security plus certification to be like, did you turn it off? Did you turn it back on kind of jobs? Like right. that's how ridiculous they are about it. Right. Um, <clears throat> so the question that I had was, I'm super passionate about servers. That's the thing that I really like. I like like the flow of information. I like management and things like that. Um, what should I get in addition to security to like get my foot in the door towards that kind of situation? Because in my situation, security is a it's a non. It's like you have to do it if you want to find a job here. Right. Yeah. The in the that particular part of the world, and really anybody who works with specifically Department of Defense, but you see a lot of these requirements will bleed over into other federal positions in the United States is these 
uh, these mm -hmm. DOD requirements where the minimum certification you need to have is a uh, a security plus. The minimum is not a plus. The minimum is network plus. And that's why you see that for these positions that you think it's a help desk. Why do you need security plus? That's why. Uh, it's an, ar mm -hmm. I wouldn't say an arbitrary requirement, but it's certainly one that is not an all, doesn't fit every scenario, and yet they make it fit every scenario. There's the federal government for you. So that's just one of those, mm -hmm. one of those unique pieces of government. I think if you're somebody who's really interested in sort of the next steps above this, really learning something that's going to uh, focus on operating systems and, and even networking, there's really two ways to go with this. The Microsoft certifications are certainly well-regarded and they will show up on a, a resume requirement that you will see a job posting requirement. Is Microsoft exams, they've gone back to the MCSE. Uh, getting Microsoft server certifications is certainly tends to be valuable regardless of where you go. On the other side are the Cisco certifications. If networking and security is a direction you think you want to go, then a great place to start is the, the latest version of what Cisco will be coming out for their CCNA. Uh, there's sort of Cisco Certified Network Administrator Certification. There's a new one coming out in February that there's already a book out for it. So if you're going that direction, that's a great way to go as well. Okay. Yeah, I um, I actually just recently graduated with a degree in computer networks and cybersecurity. Okay. So I've had like dabbling in, in different kind of things. So I had to take a Cisco class. I took, I kind of lead more towards the Microsoft server side Great. Uh, and things like that. But uh, that's good to know that both of those would help push towards that. You, you may find... Thing. Yeah, I, I've been... In, in my sorry, career, you know, these things have you know. sort of gone back and forth. I did tons of workstation administration, server administration, and eventually it melded into network and then finally security. So your path might be a little mm -hmm. bit different, or it might be one where you focus on Microsoft. Then all of a sudden, an opportunity comes up for Linux, and you get Linux certified, and you go down a whole path dealing with Linux. You never know which direction this is going to go. Yeah, I get that. Uh, yeah, so I just want to say again, like everybody else has, thank you very much for uh, putting all this out. Uh, I'm taking the Security Plus exam next Thursday. I've been studying. I stumbled onto you like a couple days ago. I've been studying on my own volition, uh, but I've been looking at your videos and some of the stuff you've uh, popped up to and using that as material too. So that'll be interesting to see how it goes. Well, you, it's, it's right around the corner. So now's the time to grab the exam objectives, check the things you don't know, solidify those, and now you're ready to go. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Vic. Uh, good luck with the rest of your stream. Appreciate the call. That's uh, it's always good to see that happening. We're we're getting close now to that certification. Uh, thanks for holding. We've got an international caller. Uh, what's your name? Where are you calling from? Hello, caller. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Maybe listening to the stream. You may want to mute those streams if you're calling in on the phone and listen in because there is a little bit of a delay. Hello, caller. Are you there? I thought he was there. We're going to put you back in the queue, and maybe we'll come right back to you. We'll go to the 703 area code. Hello, caller. What's your name? Where are you calling from? Hi, my name is uh, Mohammed, and I'm calling from Fairfax, Virginia. Another Virginia caller. What can we do for you, Mohammed? I have a question. Um, I'm currently studying for Security Plus. I'm trying to land a position as a SOC analyst. I was right. wondering, should I add... Should I add ethical hacking to it as this, a plus? Well, in, I just stick with my security plus? This was kind of a, a conversation that was going on the chat room uh, at the end of the first hour, in fact, is that there's so many different places to go with security after you get security plus. Security plus certainly is the entry leveled into the security world. And there's a few places to go. I guess the gold standard in the industry for certifications is the CISSP, but the CISSP is one that also requires that you already have practical experience. So it's not generally a good next certification as you're getting into the security world. A lot of people in your particular area choose the Certified Ethical Hacker, the CEH. And uh, the CEH is a very, as, as we saw in the chat room, uh, it's a very polarizing certification because it has had 
a bit of a storied past, and it is one that some people really like the content that's on there. Other people don't like the the way that the certification is perceived in the industry. So there is there's pluses and minuses to that. I think if you were to look at the exam objectives for the CEH, kind of take the the storied past and the the the, the reputation out of the scenario. I think the content on the CEH is pretty good. I think that's why CompTIA came out with the CISA exam, uh, the the cybersecurity exam, uh, because they wanted to compete with the content that was on the CEH. And I think they did a pretty good job with that. Um, that's probably where I would think of going. If you were thinking of eventually getting the CISSP, uh, that's from a company called ISC Squared. They have a certification that is just under that, it's not the CISSP, uh, that is one level below, it's sort of planning to get the CISSP that doesn't require all of that certification. I wish I could remember this off the top of my head. I'm on their website now. So it's the, which one is it? Is it the SSCP or is it the one before that? I think it's the one before that. Um, yeah, it's the SSCP, the uh, uh, Security Administration exam. So there may be other options that allow you to get a ISC squared certification without having the practical experience required for the CISSP. And that may be a good stepping stone if eventually you're looking to get that CISSP certification. The good part is you got a lot of options. You just need to find the one that fits best with what you would like to learn and the one that fits best with what your employers would like you to learn. That's that sounds fair. Um, my other question is, um, I have a little bit of experience. Actually, I was pursuing cybersecurity in school, but I wasn't able to complete school, so I'm taking the certification route. Um, I understand some companies do help pay for school. Would it be logical for me to get an associate's degree and then get the certification or get the certification and then get a job and then go back to school? It's a... It's kind of a situation where it's a uh, not all companies do a, um, a a way to reimburse for for school. Some do, some encourage it, some don't. Um, one of the greatest jobs I thought someone had. I I was talking with uh, one of my previous customers who worked for a community college, and he says this is great. I can be technical and do my uh, IT security and networking during the day. And then at night, I go to class for free and I work on another degree. So I thought that was a great way to do it. A lot of companies will pay for tuition, though. Uh, not all companies do. And what I think I like to focus on instead is what can get me the job and then whatever benefits come from the job are really just gravy. Having that job is probably the most important part of this. And I think that's where I would probably focus my efforts too. Um, if nobody will hire you without having the associate's degree, well, that answers the question. Go get the associate's degree. If you can get a lead on a job that has a tuition reimbursement and you don't have to have that, that uh, formal education, maybe that's the way to go. Uh, every employer is a little bit different, so there's no single answer to that question. Well, thank you very much, Professor Messer. Best of luck, Muhammad. I think it's that's a challenge, though. You never know what people in your area are going to offer for this. Uh, let's go. I see there in chat room the uh, the international call has uh, puts a few things in chat. So let's see if we can can talk with them. Hello, caller. Which name are you calling from? Are you there, caller? Can you hear us? So we're giving it a shot. I can hear you. <laughs> it's. One of those scenarios. We're going to have to put you back in the queue, I guess. Figure out those pieces. And for those of you listening in, I don't have a, uh, a producer on the show. I'm my own producer. So uh, you get to listen to me pick up the phones cold as we go to 784. Hello, Hello, Colleen. I'm here with you. Well, hello. Thanks. Yes, I'm hello. And Frida. Hello, Frida. What can we do for you? Okay. Yes, um... I'm calling to find out um, how I can get some help with log files. I need to know where can I find more log files questions Okay. and understand better log files. I will give you a little tip 
that I was thinking about just yesterday on log files is that, fortunately on the exam, by the way, I think what a lot of people have thought about log files and what a, a number of different sites are mentioning about log files is way beyond what the exam is looking for. The exam wants you to see a log file and then interpret what the log is saying. And they're not looking for a lot of detail. Um, so I think what would help a lot of people is if you were able to go to an actual log and look to see what that log is saying. Uh, but of course, uh, I don't have a full-blown um, log file generation tool thing on my site. My Soho router doesn't create a lot of logs. I don't have a next generation firewall or a firewall at my house to do this. Uh, there's not a lot of options there to be able to do this. So one of the things I recommend that people do is, in a way, take advantage of some free resources that might be on the internet. There are a lot of firewall companies, for example, on the internet that have demonstration systems that are out and just waiting for somebody to take advantage of those. Um, and I'm trying to find a link here as I, as I uh, am going through this. And I found a link the other day for this. Uh, let me type this in and see if I can get to this particular page. So, for example, and this is one of many of these on the internet, is a full-blown firewall. This is a demo site uh, at Untangle, demo.untangle.com. And I don't know how much they'll appreciate me talking about this since we're not looking to buy or use the product. We just want to see the log files. Uh, but this is a demo system that has real data going through it. This is not at my studio. This is out just on the internet as a demo system. And they have other things you can see with this, such as the filters and the firewalls. And there's got to be log. I'm This is the first time I've really gone through this particular firewall to pull this in. But they have logs and other information in here that we can pull from. So this would be a great place to go to be able to see information about these logs and be able to break down what there happens to be on this firewall. And I'm kind of poking around at this, but this is not a firewall that I do a lot of work with uh, to be able to see these things. Um, but you can start to get information about this firewall. And certainly there's going to be some logs on here. On my videos, I just typed in firewall live demo. And that was the, the hook that I put into Google that got me tons of live demo sites for actual firewalls. And if you happen to know a firewall manufacturer, put in the name of that firewall manufacturer and live demo, and you may be able to find some sites that let us log in with username, demo, password, demo, and they have extensive logs there available that you could go through. It's a great way to become more familiar with what's available in the industry as far as some of the firewalls available. And then you actually get to play around with some of the firewalls and see what they're doing there. I think that's a, a great way to go about it. I finally found the logs under the sessions menu on here. So here's an actual log from this firewall. And you can see it has the protocol, whether this was bypassed or not, the policy that was used on this firewall, the host name and username, the interface that it came from, the address, the port number that was going, that's from the client. And on the server, the interface, address, port number, country, and more information about the client here. Tons of information in that single log entry. That's what we're talking about is this content in the log where you can see client address postnat, client address prenat, uh, server address, bandwidth priorities, port numbers that are in use, the protocols in use, the remote addresses. You have to be able to decipher that. So if uh, CompTIA was to ask in this particular session flow, what was the public IP address from the client that was communicating using port 6969 over UDP, you'd have to find that in the log file. That's that's as complicated as it gets. It, they're not looking for you to go through hexadecimal code and determine what type of vulnerability was inside of that. Uh, nobody needs to know that anyway. Your IPS is going to give you all that information. You just need to be able to read the logs in that IPS and go about it that way. This happened to be untangled. There's a lot of other options available on the internet from a lot of other firewall companies, intrusion prevention systems that you can get into and do that for free. Thank you very much, Professor Messer. Thanks, Frida. I appreciate you calling.
that's that's always a challenge is finding the right information. My video on log files goes through a little bit of this, but it doesn't go through a lot. So being able to get, as I mentioned, more hands-on, be able to become more familiar with these log files, become more familiar with where you would find them in a firewall, that's a great place to go to find out where all of those things might be um, and make those happen. Uh, in the chat room, some people are even putting some names of firewalls. I don't want, I kind of mentioned Untangle because they had one that was a demo site that was easy to get to. I don't want everybody to overwhelm the demo system on any of these sites uh, with all of this, but they're available for free for you to use for those purposes. So why not take advantage of them? Just pick a firewall company and see if they have a live one you can log into. That might help you as well. Uh, last chance for this uh, other caller. Hello, caller. Are you there? What's the name and where are you calling from? So close. Right there. I can hear you. But it just didn't work out this time. We'll have to try our our Skype configuration next time uh, to see if that. So in the chat room, people are mentioning that. So how can you know from the logs if it's a remote access Trojan or if it's a worm or whatever it happens to be? You probably won't see that from the logs we just looked at. But one moment. But one of the nice things about the exam is they're not asking you to go through the logs to find a worm. So they're not asking you to go through the logs to find a uh, a, a particular type, a buffer overflow. They're not asking you that. They want you to be able to read the log and be able to see what's there. And if you have an intrusion prevention system log, maybe you can find an instance of that. And some of these next generation firewalls will have that in there. And the way you know it's a buffer overflow that was blocked is it tells you, we blocked a buffer overflow. So it's not a, it's not asking you to go through a hex dump and be able to parse out, was this a, a worm? No, we don't know. Nobody knows. Nobody does that. Uh, there are folks over on the, on the computer science side that do that type of analysis, uh, but it's not something that IT folks do. We look at our intrusion prevention log that tells us that a buffer overflow was blocked. That's how we know. It tells us that a remote access Trojan was down, attempted to be downloaded and we blocked it. Uh, that's what you would find in your log file. Uh, is, it's very obvious. Uh, it was downloading rat.exe, file was blocked. That's what's in the log. So that's what, that's what they're looking for you to know about. And there are a number of log questions on the exam. There's not a lot. There's not a ton of log questions on the exam. Uh, because it's such a small section of a small area of a much larger domain of six domains. So you're not going to get pages and pages and pages of log files, and they're not going to be that complex. They're going to ask you some very basic questions about that particular thing. So that's where they that's where the the real focus is is if you if you look at log files, just how do I read through it, I think you'll be fine. We're not looking for a lot of detail and how to make all of those other things happen. Well, we've gone through even another hour uh, plus of questions. Uh, I think that brings us to the end of another Security Plus study group. Thank you for being here. Thank you for calling in to the study group. Thanks for uh, being with us in that first hour for our Q&A. And thanks for hanging around for the second hour as well. We would not be able to do this without you. And we, we just love doing it. It's always a good time. Thanks for your questions in that second hour. And thanks for being here. Uh, we look forward to having you on the next study group. we got two for A-plus in a couple of weeks. We've got our Network Plus and Security Plus next month. We'd love to have you come back and do some more of those. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time on the Security Plus study group. We are sorry, but...